Hello, everyone. Very good morning to all of you in the south part of the globe, in Indonesia, Malaysia, Laos, and anywhere else. And a very good evening for the, the northerner who come from United States. I think I, I see uh, come here my colleague who is based now in uh, New York City and myself too. Uh, welcome to our very important event today, uh, which is the regional uh, event, uh, part of the uh, Global Symposium of Ubuntu, which is organized by the Global Men Engage. Uh, just uh, to let you know that uh, this event today is organized by a collaborative work involving the Ministry of Women's Empowerment and Child Protection of the Republic of Indonesia, and then the Indonesian Country Representative of the United Nations Population Fund, or UNFPA, and also the Indonesian Women's Alliance, which is you know, a lion consisting of a, a various organization, the NGOs, and then also, as I said, this is part of the Ubuntu Symposium organized by uh, the Men Engage uh, Global uh, uh, Global Alliance. So today's events, uh, we will we, we we is the webinar. We're going to discuss. Hari ini adalah dalam bentuk webinar kita akan berdiskusi transforming patriarchal masculinity for gender justice. We're going to uh, uh, have some lesson learned from the past, which is because this, this initiative is already built uh, like quite long. And then uh, from that lesson learned, we're going to try to build and develop new idea and agenda for uh, the new initiative and activism. Uh, Let's start our event today uh, with the singing of Indonesian uh, national anthem, the Great Indonesia or Indonesia Raya. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen and other genders, please uh, enjoy the Indonesia Raya. Indonesia tanah airku tanah tuh Yang di bahasa Indonesia bisa ke bahasa Inggris dulu untuk bisa mendengarkan Di sana Thank you so much. Uh, that's the Indonesia, Indonesia Raya or the Great Indonesia. I apologize for my colleague from Mongolia, Laos, and Vietnam not to screen your national anthem. <laughs> Maybe next time, okay? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, before that, uh, we have some announcement. Uh, first, uh, this webinar is, uh, uh, you know, equipped with the interpreters. So those who uh, cannot follow with the English, you can switch uh, with the interpretation. Uh, yeah. There is a, a button in the bottom. Tidak bisa mengikuti dalam bahasa Inggris. Anda bisa menggunakan fitur interpretasi. Jadi ada link juga untuk mengisi lembaran evaluasi. Jadi mohon ditunggu untuk sesi tanya jawabnya. Berikutnya saya akan mengundang Ibu Anjali Sen. Uh, for, for Indonesia of the United Nations Population Fund or UNFPA uh, who support our event now. Uh, uh, Miss Anjali Sen, uh, the floor is yours. Untuk membangun keadilan jenis bagi semua. Dan kita akan membahas hal-hal yang bisa dilakukan. Membahas webinar hari ini. Dan kita akan membagi pembelajaran praktek-praktek terbaik. Serta praktek-praktek yang menjanjikan untuk mentransformasi 
But for me personally, this is uh, this is very important. Uh, I was earlier with the International Planned Parenthood Federation, and I have also worked uh, closely with the Men Engage Alliance uh, on this. So it, it it is a subject which is of deep interest to me as well. Uh, for UNFPA here, male involvement can be utilized as a strategy for changing gender norms and has harmful masculinities in society. In Indonesia, the government of Indonesia, with technical support from us in UNFPA, we sh shows a very strong commitment through the establishment of the National Reference Group as a national advocacy platform for coordination and networking on male involvement uh, issues and the development of two important policy documents on the national framework on male involvement and uh, standard operating procedures on the integration of male involvement in GBV and sexual and reproductive health policies and programs. And learning from this series of webinars which have been organized in Indonesia as part of the Indonesia country event for this third Men Engage Global Symposium. Of course, we have some lessons learned, good and promising practices, which have coming out from all the initiatives undertaken by local actors using strategy for really transforming patriarchal masculinity. And these uh, initiatives will significantly contribute for the improvement of gender transformative programs in Indonesia and indeed other countries in the region. And we need to document all of these. So along with all the social and political dynamics and the emergence of this new generation of activists who speak out for democracy and demands for social justice for all, it's really very important at this time to examine the current situation and the dynamics of contemporary activism rel relating to the transformation of uh, patriarchal masculinity in East and Southeast Asia. And also it's equally important to discuss future act activism and to examine the importance of solidarity among activists in the region and build a more equitable and just society in the region. And really to engage men in the efforts, efforts to fulfill women's rights, sexual reproductive health and rights, and to achieve uh, gender justice for all. And we really see the importance of this webinar to provide a space for reflection of sharing lessons learned from all the initiatives. And hopefully this forum provides an opportunity to discuss recommendations on the future activism, of engaging men and boys as strategic partners to achieve uh, gender equality. Uh, so really, I, on behalf of UNFPA, I really want to thank all of you, thank the Deputy Minister for Community Participation from the Ministry of Women's Empowerment and Child Protection, and all of you, the resource persons who are here with us, and all our CSO partners, and all those who are really working on the ground uh, to achieve uh, I bring about this transformative change to achieve gender justice for all. And I really wish us all a very productive meeting with fruitful discussions, a lot of learning, exchange of uh, recommendations, exchange of learnings, good practices. And I'm sure we will come out with good uh, quality outputs, uh, which we can really uh, take forward. And uh, uh, the presentations are going to be really bringing us all together to reflect and think together. So I thank you all, and I wish you really a very productive uh, meeting today, and uh, look forward to the discussions. Terima kasih. Terima kasih, Banya. All the very best. Thank you. Uh, terima kasih, uh, Ms. Sen. Thank you so much for delivering such a great uh, speech. Uh, uh, Mrs. Ms. Sen from the uh, Office of uh, Indonesian Representative of the United Nations Population Fund or UNFPA. Thank you for showing uh, a great support and commitment to this very important work and also for highlighting the important of continuing the collaborative work between uh, different part, you know, organization and individual to make sure that this work is uh, uh, ongoing and continue. Uh, thank you so much. Let's uh, uh, continue uh, with the uh, remark from 
uh, Mr. Indra Gunawan from the Ministry of uh, Women's Empowerment and Child Protection. Mr. Indra Gunawan is the Deputy Minister for uh, Community Participation. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Indra Gunawan from the Ministry of Women's Empowerment and Child Protection of the Republic of Indonesia. Uh, Mr. Indra Gunawan, the stage is yours. Yeah, uh, thank you, Pak uh, Farid. Uh, I would like to welcome and appreciate, appreciate the honorable guests, UNFPA representative, Ms. Anjali Sen, the resource person, Dr. Hong Tu An from Center for Creative Initiative in Health and Population Vietnam, Mr. Kam Safat Chan Tafisok, the member of Regional Learning Center for Gender Justice in East and Southeast Asia, Mr. Margianta Surahman Jidi from Youth Adv Advisory Panel, UNFP Indonesia, Ms. Undaria Tumursuk, PhD from Mongolian Feminist National Network, and also Mr. Farid Mutakin as, uh, from the University of New York in Hampton. Uh, Ministry of Women Empowerment and Child Protection would like to express our appreciation to Aliansi Laki Laki Baru, Women Crisis Center Bengkulu, Yayasan Pulih, IPPA Chapter Rio Island, Rifka Anissa, Women Crisis Center, Gema Alam, and Center of Image, Imaging Society Timor for joint collaboration in organizing a regional forum on male involvement with technical support from UNF, UNFPA Indonesia. Today webinar is a part of Indonesia country event for third engagement global symposium, Ubuntu Symposium. The event itself started from 3rd November to 19 November 2020. That consists of three scholar webinar in the first week, the third subnational webinar in the second week, and one national webinar in the third week, and one webinar in the third week in November. Minister of Women and Empowerment and Child Protection see the importance uh, of engaging men and boys to achieve gender equality. It's important to engage men and boys for gender just justice because and the construction of masculinity in patriarchal culture contribute to hamper the achievement of gender equality and the elimination of all forms of discrimination and violence against women, including gender-based violence. Gender inequality has had a negative impact on the personal lives of men as well as women. Men can play a positive role to eliminate discrimination and GBV and to achieve gender justice. In patriarchal culture, the majority of strategic position in society, including in family, government, institution, private sector, are occupied by men. However, we have to aware the risk of the and or danger of engaging men and boys for gender justice. Since the culture patriarchal has strong influence in our society, including the culture belief and practice as well as religion interpretation. If the strategy of engaging men and boys is not carefully, properly and critically used, it will be counterproductive for women's movement in achieving gender justice and equality. And it may give more privilege to men and absorbing resources used for women empowerment initiative. To mitigate the risk engaging men and boys, we must take into account the value and principle of the gender transformative approach. The intervention must become an integral part of initiative to achieve gender justice, orient to personal and structural change, aim to change the power relation, accountable to women and women's movement and use positive approach to the men's group to reduce their resistance. Actually, in Indonesia, we have a long history of involving men in GBV and reproductive health issues. 
such as Swami Siaga, a program that involves men uh, or father to improve maternal and neonatal health, advocacy on male contracep contraception in family planning, engaging in PMTS or HIV AIDS prevention program through sexual transmission, furthering class or other community discussion with young men on GBV prevention and reproductive health in Jogja, Lampung, Jakarta, Papua, West Nusa Tenggara, and other area in Indonesia. Men consulting for male as well as male prepar preparator of violence, and also so social media campaign, such as uh, in the Pikiran Lelaki, Never Okay Project, and Aliansi Laki Laki Baru, uh, pro feminist men's network for ne network for transformative uh, patriarchal masculinities. All the initiative highlighted the importance of involving men in effort to achieve gender equality and encourage men to be a part of solution on the gender inequality that occurs in society. But we have to admit that. In the past, we missed to integrate uh, gender transformative as an approach. The Ministry of Women Empowerment and Child Protection has some initiative to ensure that the engagement of men and boys will foster gender equality in Indonesia, including development of national framework on male involvement and also develop, development uh, operational guidance at, or SOP on how to integrate male uh, involvement in GBV prevention and reproductive health and rights. Hopefully the initiative by government of Indonesia at policy level will ensure that the integration of male involvement strategy in policy and program improve the quality of women and rights in Indonesia. On behalf of Ministry of Women Empowerment and Child Protection, I would like to express our gratitude and appreciation to UNFPA Indonesia for supporting government of Indonesia and the representative of uh, Aliansi Lagi Lagi Baru, Women Crisis Center Bengkulu, Yayasan Puli, APPA Chapter Rio Island, Rifka Anissa, Women Crisis Center, Gema Alam and Center for Imagine Society Timor for their hard work in organizing the Indonesia country event. I wish all the particip participants to have productive and fruitful discussion during the webinar, and hopefully the good recommendation will be resulted from this. Uh, yang baik akan dihasilkan dari pertemuan regional ini. Terima kasih. The Deputy Minister of, uh, Terima kasih Pak Indah Gunawan, Wakil Menteri untuk partisipasi masyarakat dari Kementerian Pemberdayaan Perempuan dan Perlindungan Anak Republik Indonesia. Satu hal yang sangat penting adalah to this kind of initiative. You know, it is also open for uh, more collaboration with the state, which is very important in this thing because we're going to transform our uh, program, our agenda into more practical policy there, you know, so it will be more influential to the broader community. Uh, once again, thank you very much. Terima kasih, uh, Pak Indra Gunawan. Uh, all right. Uh, uh, we're going to uh, move to our uh, discussion session for now. Uh, uh, and we have uh, four speakers who are going to participate and share uh, lesson learned and their insight uh, on the uh, so-called uh, initiative of transforming masculinity for gender justice. And I think the term itself is the in, is indicating the dynamic change, you know, uh, within this kind of activism and and uh, uh, initiative. Like long time ago, uh, we think about how to to uh, encourage men to you know uh, involve in uh, doing gender roles, uh, usually all traditionally uh, performed by women. But now we think about how to 
to introduce or to uh, approach this kind of thing within the context of a, a feminist principle. So a lot of uh, going on uh, these days since the initiative of the so-called men, men engage is developed like uh, in the last one or two decade. Uh, we have four uh, speaker and uh, I'm sure, and just to let you know that all the speakers are, uh, you know, a big name in this kind of things. Uh, I know that uh, because just Google their name, you know, the, the organizer didn't provide me with any CP, but I can find their CP very easy in Google. This does mean that they are a big name in this kind of uh, initiative. We have four here. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm really honored to be surrounded by uh, my colleagues uh, who long time working on this uh, initiative. First, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, Undaria Tumursu PhD. And then second is uh, 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 Dr. Hong Tun An. And then uh, Mas, uh, another one is, uh, we have four here. Uh, let me check. Uh, and then uh, Mas or Mr. Margianta Surahman. And then um, my colleague, uh, Kamsapat Chamsaituk. Uh, uh, first, I would like to uh, introduce one by one, all the speakers, even though I, I, I know them uh, since a long time ago. Uh, first, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Undaria uh, Tumursu. Undaria is now is the uh, Regional Gender Equality Advisor to Asia uh, in the International Rescue Committee, uh, which is based in Kuala Lumpur. Undaria also uh, the uh, National Advisor right now uh, of the Mongolian Feminist Network, Monfenet, uh, and then uh, Undaria holds the PhD from uh, University of uh, uh, from New Zealand Technological University uh, in Wellington, uh, and then um, as I said, Undaria have, has been involved in this initiative since long time ago. I know her like ten years ago. Uh, joined the uh, regional learning community of. Uh, East and Southeast Asia for transforming uh, patriarchal masculinity for gender uh, equality. And then, uh, even though uh, uh, she's originally from Mongolia, but right now uh, Undaria is based in Kuala Lumpur, uh, Malaysia. Selamat pagi, uh, Undaria. Uh, and then the next is Dr. Hong Tu An. Uh, he's the director of the Center of uh, creative initiative for health and population based in Vietnam, in Hanoi, Vietnam. Uh, she's also a member uh, of the board director of Aero, if I'm not mistaken, right? Uh, uh, the Asian network for uh, research and uh, for women. That's very important organization uh, for the Asia Regional. Uh, and then uh, Mr. Margianta Surahman, the ambassador of youth movement. I know that. Uh, um, Mas Surahman is the project right now, is the project coordinator for young health program in the Lentara uh, Anak Foundation. Uh, and then the youth advisory panel for the Office of United Nations Population Fund or UNFPA. Uh, and most importantly, uh, uh, um, Mas Margianta is also the founder and executive director of Emancipate Indonesia. I saw your video in the TEDx news on YouTube, a very important speech there. <laughs> uh, and then my colleague, Kam, uh, right now is the uh, program specialist of elimination of violence against women in uh, UN Women Headquarters in New York. He's my neighbor now. Kam, when are you going to visit me? <laughs> Uh, Kam was the coordinator of the regional learning uh, community of the uh, transforming patriarchal masculinity back like 10 years ago. And we, I still uh, feel the influence of joining this kind of initiative. Like right now, uh, you know, in my academic life, also in my daily life, I, I still can remember uh, everything from the past, learning from 
you know, the regional uh, learning community transforming masculinity, this one. So everyone, that's all great name in, 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 in uh, you know, in this kind of initiative. Uh, not to uh, waste time, let's start our uh, presentation now with uh, uh, Dr. Tumursu, uh, who going to present uh, even though mostly maybe uh, she, she going to present lesson learned from uh, the Mongolia, but she also can, uh, you know, uh, share her insight about uh, how feminists uh, approach into this kind of uh, initiative of um, the so-called men engage or patriarchal uh, transformation. Uh, Dr. Tumursu, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Tumursu. Thank you. Thank you, Farid, uh, for the introductions, and thank you to all the organizers and uh, the speakers, also representatives from the ministry and from UNFPA. And I have to say, it is a pleasure to be here with uh, good friends and colleagues from the regional learning community on transforming masculinities for gender justice. So, will someone share my uh, presentation on screen? Thank you. So uh, I was asked by the organizers to uh, talk a bit about feminist perspectives on transforming masculinities. And Farid has already mentioned that when we say uh, transforming masculinities rather than engaging men and boys, this signifies a shift in the, uh, in a way, um, shift in the perspectives in terms of how we approach this work. Next slide, please. So I thought I would ask with three questions for your reflection. The first one is, what is the most effective and sustainable way to control people? I'd like everyone who is participating in this webinar to think about the technology of power and control that all of us are subjected to, that all of us participate in. Secondly, in a power hierarchy, and as soon as we say power hierarchy, it is a pyramid system, right? With few on top, with more power, with many uh, down below, with less power. Um, I don't think there's anyone ever without any kind of power, but nevertheless, we have an, uh, an imbalance with power concentrated in the hands of you. So in a situation like that, in a power hierarchy, think about how do the few at the top maintain their power against the majority? What are the mechanisms? What are the systems? What are the ideologies utilized to maintain this power? How can few control majority? The third question I want you to reflect on is, how can we bring uh, these points to the analysis of patriarchy? What are the implications of how we answer these two questions in terms of our analysis of patriarchy? Next slide, please. So I thought the way I approach as a feminist uh, activist, the way I approach um, my activism or any kind of analysis is really from the point of view of analyzing power systems that are unequal and unjust. I didn't become a feminist because I'm a woman. I became a feminist consciously in my um, mid to late 20s even because I'm opposed to any system of injustice. And patriarchy is a system of power, right? It, which has its own logic of power and control, which is common to other systems of power similar to patriarchy. So one of the uh, ways in which patriarchy and other unjust power systems effectively and sustainably control people is by colonizing people's minds. Right? by oppressing people's inner power, our self-confidence, our innate natural sense of right and wrong. In other words, also our freedom, 
our soul. And it does so by setting people against impossible standards. And impossible, not just in terms of impossibly high. For example, if we are in a fairly authoritarian culture of education, teachers might tell us that we have to be A students all the time, right? But in a power system, it's not just that the standards are high. Oftentimes those standards are inhumane. So if we think about how patriarchy impacts on men, men are supposed to be uh, not just unemotional, but they're allowed to express only one kind of emotion, which is anger and aggression. Boys are not allowed to cry. Men are not allowed to express uh, their tender feelings. And that is inhumane. Whatever the impossibility may be, oftentimes what you will find is that it's simply those standards, dominant standards are humanly impossible because it is not in our nature as humans or it is not our reality as humans or we would have to sacrifice so much. And even then we would never ever really comfortably say, yes, we have achieved those standards set by the dominant system. So in a situation like that, what happens is that you live in a perpetual lack of self-confidence, in a perpetual state of self-doubt. And you rely on others to tell you whether you are succeeding, whether you are right, whether you are doing uh, things the right way. So there is that, uh, the standards are not just there, take it or leave it, they are there and the system coerces and forces us to accept them, to aspire to them, but also the system convinces us through various means that we should aspire to those standards in order to succeed in life. So we are convinced to internalize those standards. Next slide. Next slide, please. The previous one, number two. Okay. So then if you think about it, what's the other uh, mechanism for maintaining power and control against the majority, right? So what happens in a power hierarchy, as I said, the majority are oppressed and very few benefit. Few have more power and many have much less power. In such a situation, those who are oppressed need to be kept separate from each other. So you think, again, if you are thinking of, for example, political authoritarianisms, free media, freedom of speech is number one enemy. Authentic communication is the biggest threat to unjust power hierarchies because if the oppressed come together and realize their shared oppression, they will begin to, re to realize that the system is unjust. They will begin to seek ways to resist and dismantle that system. This is why authoritarian ideologies and patriarchy is one of them. They breed distrust, hatred and denigration and violence is key to doing this. Next slide. It is also important to understand that system of power and control is not only about force, open domination. It is not only about coercion. It is also about uh, conditioning, softer ways of uh, controlling. All systems of control have dual mechanisms, reward on one hand, punishment on the other. And this relates to the analysis of power that power is not only negative, it is not only about controlling, but it is also productive in the sense that it produces desire in people to comply with the rules of the dominant game. Quote unquote, successful systems of power hierarchy are hegemonic. And this word hegemonic is extremely important if we are going to effectively address patriarchal masculinities. What this means is that people are systematically conditioned from young age, we would say even before birth, to internalize the logic of power, 
the dominant values and norms. In hegemonies, oppression is so naturalized and normal that it becomes invisible. It is just how things are. This is the reason why it is so difficult to find the right language, right examples to convincingly educate people about patriarchy because people are so used to patriarchy. They don't even see it. They just see it as life, as how things have always been, how things are, how things will always be. What's the point talking about it? Those of you who have worked in the area, I think know that oftentimes it is really difficult to confront people's extremely strong sense of reality and truth. At the same time, there is punishment for non-compliance. It is always looming large. And again, again and again, violence is an integral part of unjust systems. So if you fail to properly internalize, if you fail to properly aspire towards the impossible standards the system sets up, you will be punished. And punishment comes in many different forms. It can be physical violence, it can be verbal, it can be exclusion, marginalization, denial of rights resources. Next slide. So what does this mean? Right, this analysis of power, uh, uh, the logic of power and control, what does this mean for analyzing masculinities? First of all, as I mentioned, patriarchy needs to be understand, uh, understood as a hegemonic system of power and control. It uses gender, and we should remember not only gender, but gender is certainly a primary category uh, that is used by patriarchies for unequally distributing power and privileges on one hand, costs and burdens on the other, and to legitimate this unequal and unjust distribution. Patriarchy is systemic, it is socially constructed, it, and then it, it is naturalized. It produces and maintains unjust gender hierarchies based on notions of male superiority and female inferiority. Secondly, patriarchy, it is important to understand that it establishes, that it establishes a bi-gender heteronormative system, which means that it, uh, it imposes this notion that the humankind comes in two and only two uh, forms, male and female, that there are no other people. If there are other people that don't fit into these two boxes, they are unnatural, they are deviant, they should be marginalized. In some cases, they should be eliminated literally. This is why there is so much um, violence and crime and hate crime against people who are non-binary, against people who deviate from the heteronormative um, model. Uh, this is why gender and sexual minorities are also severely oppressed under patriarchies. This is also why men who are not quote unquote masculine enough and women who are not feminine enough are severely punished oftentimes. But the reality is that humankind is much more diverse. There is a much greater diversity of bodies, gender identities and sexualities. So there is that mismatch already we can see between the bi-gender ideology of patriarchy and between reality of the human experience and existence. Thirdly, patriarchy sets up ideal type masculinities and femininities that are humanly impossible. In other words, the dominant gender norms are oppressive. And fourthly, patriarchy uses coercive as well as productive power to keep men, women, and others alienated from each other and their own selves. So if you think about all of these different kinds of phenomena, misogyny, transphobia, homophobia, also how shame is used to control people, how, how all of this breeds distrust and violence and how distrust and violence then also breeds misogyny um, and uh, discrimination against women and anybody else who doesn't fit into the bi-gender system. 
Next slide. This is the last thing I'm going to say in terms of this conceptual framework. It is extremely important to remember and systematically try to factor into our activism the understanding that patriarchy does not act alone. Patriarchy is, not, is a system that dynamically intersects with other systems of injustice, such as racism, nationalism, cultural and religious fundamentalisms, as well as imperialism and colonialism. And we have to call out neoliberal capitalism as well. And all of these plus patriarchy are intrinsically linked. The oppressive nature of patriarchal masculinities as well as femininities needs to be analyzed intersectionally as well as taking into account the power dynamics in the global order. So not only within local context, not only within national context, but within the international context. So I want to uh, take you through three examples of Mongolian masculinities to highlight what this analysis uh, means. Next slide. So this is an example of uh, feminist analysis of patriarchal masculinities. We developed uh, in 2007, we began to work uh, carefully on transforming masculinities and then gradually uh, following what we called analytical discussions on masculinities and gender justice, we began to develop a training program uh, on transforming masculinities. And one of the exercises we came up with was to uh, involve participants in the identification of dominant models of masculinity in their given context. And notice that I'm using the word masculinities in plural. There is never one masculinity and there is never one uh, femininity. There is never even one patriarchal masculinity in one given context. There are several, uh, uh, sometimes competing, sometimes coexisting models of masculinities. So we came up with these three models. I guess many of you might not know much about Mongolian history, but I think most of you would know that in the 13th to 14th and a little bit into the 15th century, Mongols, my ancestors, um, were rulers of much of the world. So, and we were nomadic, uh, we come from nomadic uh, pastoralism. So on the left, you see one traditional and very popular model of masculinity, which is the rural herdeman. You can see how strong he is, right? Physically strong. And uh, there is this notion of expansiveness, freedom, when you think herder. And there is also this notion of him being laid back. The second person, I will talk a little bit more about all of these models. The second person depicts what we decided to call the hero model. So this is the grandson of Chinggis Khan in a way. There is a strand of masculinity in Mongolia that uh, centers their discourse, their identity, on the imperial history of Mongols, Genghis Khan and his conquests, Mongol warriors. And then the third picture depicts the new Mongol, the post-socialist and neoliberal capitalist, I would say, Mongol, the modern man. Next slide. Excuse me, Daria, just a gentle reminder. You have three more minutes to finish the presentation. Okay, thank you. So if you look at this, this is the herder man. He's very manly, he's relaxed, and traditional wrestling, you see our traditional wrestlers there. You know, it's all about physical strength. But it is also, uh, there, there's also a notion of herder man um, model is that they can endure hardships, they're close to nature, um, they are carefree, easygoing, but also that they are not terribly smart, kind of simple. They are not very critical of anything. They just go with life and they're politically passive. So in the modern world, 
where you have inequality between rural areas and urban areas, much of the development concentrated in urban areas, you can tell that these are men who will not necessarily succeed in modern Mongolia. Next slide. This is the hero man. He's macho, he's a nationalist patriot, but he's also urban, even though uh, their discourse is centered on Chinggis Khan and you see his tattoo there. They're xenophobic, anti-Chinese, they're very politicized, but in a very xenophobic and very anti-women, misogynist way, authoritarian. They want to be the protectors of the nation. They want to control power. On the uh, right uh, extreme of this spectrum, you see the neo-nationalists in Mongolia, ethno-nationalists. Sadly, this model of masculinity is very attractive to young, urban, disenfranchised men. Next slide. And lastly, this is the new Mongol. This image legitimates the dominance of socioeconomic and political elite. They are wealthy, they are educated, cosmopolitan, urban. They are businessmen who also can be politicians. They are also celebrities. They are the breadwinners, they have the money, right? And they are modernized, westernized. Even though this looks like it is not traditionally Mongolian, this model, this is the model that has the power economically, socially, politically. And the other models, you can think of the hero man as serving in the interests of this political and economic elite to uh, that distract, to divert public discussion towards blaming foreigners or towards blaming Mongolian women. And then the herder man is in a way um, a simpleton whose labor is exploited. So even within patriarchal masculinities, you can see a clear hierarchy which relates to the other systems of dominance based on class, um, geography, and so on. Last slide. So men, as anybody else, ha have a right to narrate themselves, to construct themselves, to be free of oppression. They can construct their own identities, be who they want to be. So for me, feminist work on transforming masculinities for gender justice is broader than engaging men and boys in combating violence against women and girls. It is about engaging men and everyone else in actively dismantling patriarchy. It is about inviting and supporting men to liberate themselves from the oppression of patriarchal masculinities so that they can live a full life. And last thing I would say, the reason I am engaged in this work is because I believe dismantling patriarchy is everybody's work. Dismantling patriarchal masculinities is also everybody's work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tumursu, uh, for the uh, presentation. That's very important uh, insight. Uh, Dr. Tumursu provide with the key principle of feminism, how to, you know, to uh, make our program of engaging men in gender equality not to fall into, you know, another. Uh, form of masculinity or form of hegemonic masculinity we know that um, patriarchy is a, a is a system of hegemonic power as uh, dr tumursu said uh, in the presentation and but uh, uh, it is also important to underline here while this is the hegemonic system of power it is also also constructed to certain social and political power which means that we can change it we can transform it into a more equal and uh, uh, just, uh, you know, uh, uh, power relation. So another word, which is non-patriarchal word, is still possible if we continue working on this. Uh, but it is it, it is also very important to keep in mind that we need to really 
work together with the feminist network here, with the feminist, uh, you know, uh, community to make sure that our program of engaging men not to fall into a new masculinity. The men engagement program is not about men cooking or not cooking, men taking care of a baby or not baby. It is about changing our patriarchal, um, you know, mindset into more equal and just uh, power relationship. So that's a very important, uh, you know, point uh, brought by uh, Dr. Tumursu. And and again, that as a social construction, we, we can change it, we can transform it uh, if we continue working on this. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, just for the audience and participant, uh, we're going to have a, a, a question and answer session later after all the other speaker present the, their presentation. Okay, next, uh, we're going to have uh, another speaker, which is Dr. Hong Tuan, the director of the uh, Center of the Creative Initiative of Health and Population based in Hanoi, uh, Vietnam. Uh, Dr. Uh, Tuan will present the experience from uh, Vietnam, how to transform patriarchal masculinity into you know, uh, 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 gender equality. Unlike Dr. Tumursu, who focus more on you know, uh, conceptual and theoretical framework, we can learn more practical from uh, uh, you know, the program initiated by CCIHAP in Vietnam. Uh, Dr. Tuan, uh, please, the stage is for you. Thank you. Thank you, Farid. Um, and thank you for the introduction. Yes, um, I think the, um, the, the, the presentation of Dr. Tumush was really provide me with the ground that I think some of the practice that we did, uh, have done in Vietnam can fit in the uh, in 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 the in the theoretical framework that uh, Dr. Tumusho was presenting to us, and um, yeah, I think and also there's been a lot of challenging that I think that uh, my presentation can um, 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 give it the way for us to to discuss further. So um, uh, next slide, please. Um, Yes, so in this presentation, I will first provide a very brief overview of the um, situation of violence against women in Vietnam, and then uh, I'll describe the two pilot models for positive masculinity, uh, one in the rural area and one in the urban uh, area in Vietnam, and then, uh, and then discuss the lesson learned and, and also give some recommendation from what they learned in the, in the program. Okay, next slide, please. Yes, uh, so uh, in Vietnam, we just uh, finished the second uh, national study on violence against women. Um, and, uh, the, and the reports that launched in, um, uh, in uh, July uh, this year. And uh, also, uh, I leave the, 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 the component on qualitative, um, the quality part of the, of the, of the study. And, and so, the first study we conducted in 2010, and after 10 years, we um, we not really see much change uh, in terms of the prevalence. So, uh, so the the most recent data show that there's been like a two out of three uh, ever marriage women experience from at least one form of violence uh, in the survey in, in their lifetime. And, uh, and then about one third of the women, um, um, ever marriage women experience from um, violence in the past uh, uh, 12 months. Uh, and, um, and violence, um, like uh, the physical uh, form of violence is about 26% uh, and 13% and experience uh, sexual, partner, uh, sexual violence. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, the the, uh, the study also shows that uh, uh, women with violence really um, the the violence against women still cause a lot of consequence related to a health physical but also mental health. So so in this uh, second study we were able to measure some of the um, indicator relating to mental health the women and it's really see that women with violence is a three time 
more in risk of mental health in comparison with women without violence. And then also violence really, um, and there's also there's evidence of violence that caused a lot of consequence towards sexual and reproductive health of the women, such as the um, uh, high risk of miscarriage. Um, and then also um, if people think about like uh, investing for uh, in investing in program for um, um, to prevent violence against women, um, maybe a concern for some state because of the resource. Then I think the survey also show that if we not invest, and then we also lost a lot. So so the study show that Vietnam lost about 1.8 percent of the GDP due to the violence against women. And, and the women uh, lost about 30% of their annual income due to the violence. So that is a, a, like a brief, uh, like a picture of what did the, uh, the current situation is about. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, now I will just uh, focus on the, uh, the uh, the two um, the pilot model that we work with men um, to prevent gender-based violence. And one's in um, uh, Kulong, and it's a coastal district in the central area of Vietnam. And the man that is mostly like a fishing man. And uh, when and we and this pilot model we conduct in the, from 2012 to 2000, uh, until 2016. Uh, and um, and the and the group we work with is the man who uh, like a perpetrator man, the so man who already identify as a perpetrator. Uh, so we um, um, we work with them and like uh, to convince them to join the program voluntary because in Vietnam uh, we don't have a compulsory like a, we don't have a policy that perpetrator have to be in compulsory education program. Uh, like many some other countries, so it really helps us to work with them on the voluntary basis uh, and the program. Uh, so they they form together uh, as a club and they call as a responsible man club. So the, the name of the club is, is also um, like uh, identified by themselves. They, that is uh, the name that they want to be called. Uh, and the in and, and for the man who who enroll in the club. They went go through. Uh, they they went through fourteen club sessions and two public sessions. And in these two public sessions, there's also involved uh, family members. Um, um, so, like uh, I think in the in the last slide that Dr. Tumushok also said, working with men is not just about working with men, but we also have to mobilize all other people in the society uh, to work together uh, for all this uh, transformation. Uh, and uh, and and in the um, uh, in in Hanoi, uh, so 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 far in Vietnam, uh, mostly we only have the uh, the the model to work with men in the rural area, and and somehow working with men in the rural areas uh, is a bit easier because the, in the rural area often we have a, a type of mass organization who can help to to connect and to regroup men. One thing we also wonder that like how about urban men, men who live in a city, because uh, from a study we show that there's a, a bit higher um, a prevalence of violence against women in rural area, but the prevalence in urban area also not low. So it's important to also work with men in the city. Uh, but then we know that working with men is still also very difficult because also, for example, like Hanoi is a big city. How can we find the men and um, and have them to work with us? So we just pilot the two um, clubs in in Hanoi and Hạ Long. Hạ Long, no, is uh, in Quảng Ninh. Uh, if you know uh, Vietnam, you know Hạ Long is like a very beautiful place for tourists. Uh, is we have a hot log bay. Um, so, so this is also like, like the two city. And, um, and uh, the program including 10 sessions, and then we also plan like for two family sessions. Um, 
we have a like a big discussion on like a, how how many sessions that we should have, and people already think that ten sessions is already quite long. So so we have to revise that uh, the fourteen club session to ten. But also we like uh, we also have to revise the content because the 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 the, the needs the interest of the man in the city in like also different from the man in the rural area. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. So in this uh, um, pilot model for gender transforming, we also focus on the starting from changing norms. Um, and, uh, and, and for the norm here, it's uh, really like Protum uh, uh, also said, it's not really like uh, to say uh, uh, what is wrong or right. Um, but also more like uh, to really work with this man to to challenge their the current um, uh, patriotic patriarchal thinking and uh, and the hegemonic uh, masculinity uh, because the I think the the um, the most I think the the most challenging when, when working with Naomi is that like uh, uh, like Dr. Tumusu also said it's not because of people. Um, like a, like a, you know, see this man as a, like a bad man or, or or like a potential perpetrator, but it's really see this man have the they they adopt they accept this norm uh, as a good norm. That is how they believe. Um, uh, so 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 uh, working with them on like uh, there's a lot of activity to work with them on challenging this norm and and get them reflecting that. On themselves uh, to change to like um, that kind of like a symbolic uh, violence that caused by the this norm that, that we want to work with. Uh, but uh, and then and then also we think that in in addition to to changing this norm to provide them with the specific technique that can really help them to practice these uh, new norms also important. Uh, because um, also from the uh, the research that we we did um, with uh, with this man, uh, we also found that men. I think men in Vietnam, also men in I think in many places in the world, they they grow up, they were born, they grow up, and they enter um, marriage, enter family life to become husband or to become father, without being equipped with necessary uh, skill uh, for them. Uh, and some skills very important, just like the uh, skill to express their their feeling, their emotion uh, uh, in, a, in a positive way, or the way to solve the conflict in a non-violent way. So, 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 so uh, beside the killing the norms, we, we found that providing them with specific techniques um, is so very important. Uh, and then also creating a kind of like authentic pride. Um, I think in 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 the in in the presentation that Dr. Tumusu said, she mentioned the authentic communication. Uh, and I, I think it's important. And and I think here also I emphasize the word authentic in a way that uh, because of all these the the norm, like uh, the the hegemonic um, masculinity norm that that this man that uh, they um, they embed, then they uh, that create a kind of I would call is symbolic pride. That's a pride that make them feel proud of them as a kind of like a, uh, if they they can follow the the traditional um, patriarchic um, masculinity. Um, so to ch change that and to create a kind of authentic pride that to become a, like a different man, a, a new man um, is important. Um, and then another one is that we think that as a, to echo the last sentence that Dr. Tumusto said about like a, a, to mobilize everyone else in the society is really building a collective support uh, for this man. Um, to work together uh, is important, and to maintain the norms and the practice and the and the pride that they they 
they they acquire from uh, from the from uh, participating in this uh, new pro in this, this program uh, can uh, will help them to to maintain and also to um, to uh, um, disseminate uh, this uh, uh, norm further. Uh, next slide, next slide, please. Yes. Yeah, so like I said, so when in, in the changing norm, it's the focus a lot on working with um, uh, questions like uh, what is the being man on and like uh, what does it mean as uh, being a good husband or good father? And also there's a lot of discussion on what is the real power? Uh, is that um, violent uh, can provide people a power and also like what is the meaning of violence why people should use violence and and also uh, how like a violence can really help them or not helping them to to really control other people or to achieve what they want to 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 have yeah so um, um anything it's quite interesting i think these are like all the three questions that dr tumosho Asked us at the beginning of her lecture, right? So uh, somehow I, my, my presentation is quite echo her presentation. Um, yeah, and then I think not only challenging this um, um, concept, but uh, but but there's a lot of thing we discussed about how we can nurturing this uh, positive uh, masculinity because we think that when we working with all these men, even men who are perpetrators, we are always working with them from a positive approach. That means that we were thinking of them as a, like a, a man who, who always want to be a better version of themselves to become a good, uh, good man or a good father or good husband. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So, uh, so, 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 for example, like uh, uh, this, this is uh, the, some of the quotes that uh, that uh, that I put in here to show how uh, this uh, question: how men, when they they work in this program and they 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 have uh, like a different uh, thought or question that normally men often accept for granted. For example, like uh, so. One man he asked like, oh, "Why I not dare to have a loud voice or even put my hand on somebody on the street, but I can be easily shout or even slap my my child and my wife." Um, so so he skip wonder about that, um, and and uh, or, or the other man said that like uh, instead of saying like uh, a man and I should be strong and he really see as a man and I should be gentle. So it's like uh, how people uh, trans transform or change their, their thought of being a man. Um, next slide, please. Just a gentle reminder, Dr. Tuan, you have three more minutes to finish the- Three more minutes. Okay, so I go quick. Uh, so, uh, so about the technique that we work with them with like uh, use the different technique, but there's one technique that many men mentioned after that um, in the evaluation and they found that, they thought that this uh, kind of like a rescue technique for them, even is a very simple, it's a timeout technique. This is just a technique that help them, help men to understand themselves, understand all the signal of like a pre-violence. So they, they know how to stop, when to stop. Uh, and, and, and really this change them, the way they think about violence and to handle anger. Uh, uh, because in Vietnam, the normal way people always think that when men is in anger, woman should be the one who, who stop. And here like uh, it's convert in the way the man said that when they are in anger or when they see the wife anger, then they should be the, the one um, should be calmed out and, and the one who, 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 who control the situation. Okay, next slide, please. <laughs> yes. And then about the authentic pride. So, so actually, when there's a lot of things, uh, we discuss a lot about pride, not only discuss, but also um, give the opportunity for people to, to really receive this pride. So, and this is very much about this, all the public uh, event that uh, when the men um, uh, can, can be in the public and can show 
their gratitude to 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 their wife and their children and 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 and, and set their their new practice as a kind of um, like a new standard, like a different standard. Yeah. Uh, next next slide, please. Yeah. So so this I go quick to the result. So so here you can see that for the responsible man club. Uh, in Kerala, we really see a really significant change. Uh, so, so you know, so the men in this club, they are all perpetrators. So that means when they come out, these are like 100% of them uh, with their wife. But in the in the evaluation, uh, two thirds of them reported no violence in the last six months, um, um, and. Uh, uh, and 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 one third, like uh, the left, report that they still uh, like uh, do some violence time to time, but much much less frequent and and less severity. Like uh, most of the time, it's just it's like a slap, and 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 they say that now they continue to check, and and just for comparison, because at the same time we also do similar club with women uh, who are uh, violence survivor. And the change is only 15%. So I think this number also show how important it is to work with men. And, and, and also with the pride that they have, I think this is also important thing that we should, we should think about for later uh, activists and, and programming is that several men uh, in the program, they not only stop their, their the violence themselves, but also they, many of them become advocator and educator voluntarily. They come to talk to the other men and they're so proud that they can teach the other men how to, to not, not violent. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, and, and for the club in, in Hanoi and Quang Ning, uh, we have a hard time to get them together. The, the attendance uh, rate is quite low, but in, uh, but in the evaluation, we also show that uh, they show quite like a positive change in terms of they can control anger or, or self-control. Next slide, please. Can I change to next slide? Uh, yeah, this is not, not translated, but it also show like uh, how that man also involved much greater in uh, taking care of the children and also in housework. Um, Next slide, please. Yes. Uh, yeah, so so we see that these pilot models have a some potential, but there's also a lot of challenges. One of the things that I already mentioned is about recruitment uh, and also maintaining, like uh, um, very few clubs can maintain after we finish the program. Yeah, and it's very much depending on the local people who, like how much into settings of the local people who want to do that. Uh, so, so it's quite challenging. And, and then also so many participants also complain that the talking on this is quite serious. They said too serious and lack of sense entertainment, uh, especially for the group from the city. Because when we compare the, the group that we have, because we have the physical group, but we also, like with COVID, we also have a Facebook group. And at the moment, the Facebook group have only 200, more than 200 people. Uh, but then like we compare with group, uh, other group like a group for like a people with car or, or other group, there's many many thousand people, and and when you discover the participant, they say that, oh, our group is too serious. Even sometimes when some people want to give comment, they don't know like a which tone that they use to put the comments, so they're not be judged by other member of the group. And another challenge that now we work with men, but it's so hard to find like a good man trainer, like an inspiring man trainer. Yeah, so so not only in the rural area, but even in big city like uh, Hanoi, it's, it's very difficult to find. Uh, I think for many men trainers, they also not feel quite hesitant to, to work with uh, this topic. Uh, okay, next slide, I think the last slide. Yes, 
So uh, I think for for this uh, model, I think as even is uh, quite promising, but and also the the positive approach can see as a good way for recruitment and also transforming strategy. Uh, and and but I think there's uh, we in 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 the for uh, for other model I think we should be we should work more also on the entertainment and pride and and really I think leadership is very important to put this model forward. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, and if you have any questions, you can ask or can email me. Okay, sure. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tuan, uh, for sharing the best practice from Vietnam. Uh, one thing that's very important point from uh, the presentation is about, you know, it is possible to unlearn even the, uh, we already have uh, embraced hegemonic uh, patriarchal masculinity, but through certain process, we can unlearn and, you know, uh, uh, and rebuild a new kind of masculinity. We're going to have, uh, you know, um, more answer and question later after all the presentation finish. Uh, the, the, uh, after all the speaker finish the presentation, uh, keep in mind you also can raise your hand and uh, or write your uh, question in the chat room. Uh, next presentation, uh, I'm going to invite uh, uh, Mas uh, Johanda. I'm sorry. Uh, next presentation uh, will be um, uh, Mas Margianta Surahman, uh, who going to share um, experience from the perspective of youth. Uh, you know, uh, this day there is a challenge uh, with the millennial ongoing. And I think um, uh, Mas Margianta have a very extensive experience and what experience to work with the youth on transforming uh, masculinity. Uh, we're going to invite uh, and welcome Mas Margianta Surahman. Uh, thank you, Mas Farid. And um, greetings to all the panelists here and the attendees. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity that's been given for me. Uh, my name is Margianta Surahman, and you can call me Gian. Uh, I'm here representing the Youth Advisory Panel of UNFPA Indonesia. Uh, we, are a, uh, we are a branch of the uh, UNFPA Indonesia that actually consisted of several young people who actually advise uh, UNFPA on their programs and also engage meaningfully young people in development agendas, particularly on comprehensive sexuality education, gender equality, and uh, other humanitarian issues as well. So here, um, I think uh, the other fellow speakers have spoken very greatly about the topic here. And I learned very much uh, from the previous speakers from other contexts. And I think it was very much true that when we, when we talk about uh, masculinities and patriarchy, it comes in many forms and different complexities. And we, we don't have a one size for all uh, solution for this. So uh, this is why, as a disclaimer, I'm just going to say out, uh, out front that I'm going to speak uh, based on limitly on my uh, experience, empirical experience and practices as well, uh, and with my fellow other uh, young people uh, working in this particular issue. So engaging boys and men to transform patriarchal masculinities in Indonesia. Uh, next slide, please. Um, talking about uh, gender issues as well. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, previous slide. Uh, yes, uh, so I'm also representing my own youth led organization. It's called Emancipate Indonesia. So we're focusing on modern slavery issues and supporting the uh, well being and young workers' rights in Indonesia. And one of the particular issues that we are very concerned is actually also about gender issues, how particularly young workers, especially young women workers, are more burdened than young uh, men workers as well uh, because of the gender pay gap, because of the sexual harassment and the, uh, the, the, uh, the non-existent um, support for young women to actually speak out in particular situations and actually how, how young men also should be much more involved in not being bystanders as well in their workplace. So, yeah, so this is why this issue is also becoming our concern as well. Next slide, please. 
So what is wrong from this picture? So I, I made this um, zine. So we, we just uh, clip some stuff, random stuff from certain magazines. And we just, we, it, it was a workshop in feminist festival in Indonesia last year that we, that is usually held um, every uh, 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 two years in Indonesia. And actually um, in this festival, I, I was very much intrigued by uh, the concept of zine. And I made this zine. When I look over the magazines, I cannot help but notice that actually strategic positions, CEOs and everything, and, and also um, uh, world leaders as well, it's been dominated by, by men. And that's why I, I compiled these pictures of, of men actually. And, um, and I asked people to reflect upon this, like, uh, so what is wrong from these pictures? Um, usually I, I put this slide whenever I talk about this issue and most people will notice uh, firsthand way that, oh, there are so men there, uh, you know, and, and so little women as well. So, so this is also a, a point about representation, but how far does representation go and how far do we understand the complexities of representation? I think it's been very much discussed by the previous speakers before, but I would like to also share my part on this as well. Next slide, please. So um, the concept of masculinities, I think it's been mentioned previously before uh, by Ms. Udaria as well, um, of actually, um, we have several types of masculinities and, and actually sometimes uh, people would like to think there, there's so binary expressions of, of gender expressions uh, and sexualities, but actually there isn't. Uh, we have seen now uh, the emerging uh, changes of concept of masculinities in terms of expression here um, in Indonesia, mostly um, in my circle, uh, perhaps uh, they, they would react that those are not manly, you know, uh, why would they dress like that? But actually, uh, you know, once we understand the complexities that actually the concept of, um, you know, non-binary uh, gender expressions and, and multiple kinds of masculinities have existed even before all of this development agendas uh, have even, even entered Indonesia, if we see uh, maybe uh, in other uh, opportunities and other occasions, we can also learn more about uh, uh, what they have in Bugis as well. There are several types of gender expressions and ad identities, and it's been it's been there long way before SDGs or any other development agendas as well. So actually, this is not a very new concept, but we just you know sometimes we forget about it and slipped out of right our hand uh, out of uh, you know in in the in 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 time. Next slide, please. And also about gender issues, uh, we have seen here uh, several issues that actually are, are, we are facing uh, in Indonesia. We have a gender pay gap, we have discrimination, verbal assault, um, forced marriage, uh, physical violence, uh, harassment, exploitation, uh, of course, because we're talking about patriarchy. Uh, the one who's uh, most um, uh, disadvantaged in this terms is actually uh, uh, the women and also other sexual minorities as well. But, but one thing that connects all of these gender issues, uh, we believe as young people is actually, next slide, please. Power. So it's also about power. So I think it's been, it's been explained very brilliantly before about the power structures and about the hierarchy that is actually being maintained uh, in order for this patriarchy and also other kinds of oppression as well. It, it's been being upheld in the system and, and the structural uh, in a structural view as well. Uh, uh, and it's also about power. Uh, so it's about keeping this power gap open to that because it benefits certain groups of people and mostly uh, cis heterosexual uh, male in Indonesia with, you know, with, uh, with, uh, with very, very much privilege in Indonesia. Uh, I myself, I'm checking my privilege as well. I'm a, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm half Chinese, but I don't, I don't kind of quite look like one. So in Indonesia, that is also an, an, an advantage. I'm, a, I'm more, more people see me as a Sundanese person, which is a part of the majority. I'm also a Muslim, part of a majority. I'm a cis, cisgender heterosexual person, part, very much of the, of the majority. So I have all these kinds of power and privilege as well to actually um, roam freely and, and develop more, uh, you know, in, in a more thriving way in, in, in society in Indonesia, especially among other young people compared to other uh, young women in Indonesia. Next slide, please. So patriarchal power relations between gender. I think uh, in Indonesia also uh, we, have, we have, because of the social media, we have seen it also quite well now, very much people are, are expressing their uh, indifference, uh, but also we see the indifference among uh, the gender issues 
and the patriarchal norms are are still entrenched in many very much many many people and also internalized misogyny uh, among among women as well uh, and and a strict gender role sometimes like um, is there any such thing as um, you know um, a house husband you know like aside from housewife is there such things like that so and then why should men wear any skin cares uh, and and if you're raped what kind of you know what kind of uh, what kind of clothes were you wearing? And that is actually a question that's being raised not only by people around the victim of sexual assault, and mostly there are women, they're also being, ex being asked by the police themselves, who are actually supposed to be a safe, safe space for, for victims to report uh, uh, their, their cases and get justice done sometimes. So, so actually, this is very much an entrenched um, structural problem as well, and also about hierarchy, about um, you know about um, a forced marriage, about the uh, the early marriage that the parents thinks they have power over the children, especially the the young uh, young women, uh, the, the the girls as well. Um, many of them also married early because their 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 parents either they are uh, socially economically disadvantaged, and and also about the stigma and norms that is being perpetuated by by also not only discriminative policies but also non-existent um, set of uh, uh, regulations that actually supports uh, to, to combat these kind of issues, especially about the uh, anti-sexual uh, violence uh, uh, measures in Indonesia. Next slide, please. The patriarchy also hurts men as well, uh, although not systematically. Like it's been said, like just like the the Cure has a has a song, and boys don't cry. Uh, we have also that saying and belief in Indonesia: if you cry, you're you're a you're a you know, you're not a manly person, you know, you're not supposed to do that. You're a man, you should toughen up. And I think it exists in all kinds of cultures, uh, you know, all kinds of pop cultures as well. Uh, but actually uh, we have learned better that actually the, the young generations now, especially uh, the, the young boys and men uh, have learned that, uh, you know, another kinds of multiple, uh, you know, expressions on, on masculinities also exist. Um, and I think also uh, um, we, I have uh, the opportunity and uh, the, the experience actually to train several young uh, young uh, boys uh, among the junior high school and senior high school age uh, uh, around suburban areas of, of Bogor and Jakarta. And actually this is becoming an, an issue because many of them like they feel like they are forced to fit into certain norms like I must assault or I must harass women so I can fit in with other boys. I must smoke because smoking is manly and 73% of the men in Indonesia actually smokes. So I have to be like them, you know? So they force themselves to be unhealthy. They force themselves into doing toxic behaviors against the will of the other young girls and women around them in order to fit in into this toxic indicators of what being a man looks like. So this is becoming a problem uh, as well. So it also hurts men, but, but I have to say as well, um, you know, even, and, and I'm, I'm here also checking my privilege as, as a man as well. Uh, sometimes these discriminations against men um, is actually not about the matter of life and death. In Indonesia, if you wear the wrong clothes, so-called the quote unquote wrong clothes, just buying to go, you know, buying some eggs to a small kiosk and, you know, something could happen and someone could, you know, assault you and probably kill you as well. In that, that also happens in several cases and so happens to underage girls as well. Uh, and, and even in their death, the victims, people keep blaming the, the, the victims, these little girls as well, We're just, you know, harmlessly walking by. Uh, and that never happens to men. I, I don't think that happens to men. Uh, in my knowledge uh, and in my experience, it doesn't, it doesn't happen to me. So it's, it's morally, morally about, about women, it's more like, about life and death as well. So we must understand as well the, I think the, the, the concentration of the, what's at stake here among men and women. So, and, and it also affects us our, how we see the participation of men in this issue as well. Next slide, please. Uh, so is equal, uh, um, you know, is equal uh, means justice because we see that uh, we are promoting uh, gender equality, but also I'm very happy that our topic today actually encompasses gender justice. So the justice also means, I think like about, you know, in order to achieve justice, uh, sometimes we also have to do affirmative action. And that's why we have this, you know, women, women's special women area in Indonesia on, on trains, not because, uh, you know, some people would also just wave it off and say like, you know, if you want equality, why do you have a women special train? You know, 
uh, a women specific uh, you know trains uh, in 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 your country on your place that's because we you know uh, we have also to do like the affirmative action to actually protect women because we are seeing the statistics every year the the the, the amount of the assault and harassment also keeps increasing it's not decreasing but also we maybe we also have to see the structural way why these cases are still happening aside from changing behavior of one or two person personally perhaps we also we should also um, support the the government and the, and the country and the state to actually change the, their behavior to towards their regulation and laws and to reflect of of, of uh, the structural uh, solution to the structural problem as well in order for us to achieve the justice so so we have to support the affirmative action as well next slide please next slide please sorry Yes, yeah, so here, um, this is also from my um, my zine as well. So um, we we were talking about um, sometimes, you know, men mostly talk about women in a very objectifying way. They see women as only uh, their way to, uh, you know, to, to objectify their sexual objects as well, and to fulfill their sexual desires like a, like a pound of flesh. And this is why I never fit in with other boys growing up as a boy. Uh, I don't have many much uh, 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 boy friends, uh, friends who are boys, uh, because I, I cannot fit in with with their ways of thinking. Their set of you know set of indicators that makes me have to fit in by you know, you have to harass this girl, you have to be aggressive, you have to smoke, you have to you know do all sorts of things. These arch archetypes of of what being a manly man looks like, and and actually we have to say no to that. So I'm basically my my whole presentation is I'm I'm I'm, I'm because I'm also one of the few men male speakers here. I have to say, I'm speaking to other boys and men here, especially like we should stop this and we should uh, focus on educating other fellow boys and men as well because women knows how to be women. Women knows how to feel like women and how to deal with it, but. But men doesn't know it because we don't experience it, and and apparently we are very much part of the problem. You know, we want to be a part of solution. We want to be involved. But what kind of involvement that we do? One of them is firsthand is to remind other men as well. So we do not mansplain what women should feel and do. Like, next slide, please. So. This is one of the ways is actually what 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 I'm doing, at least in my organization and my capacity and what I'm trying to spread as well all across ASEAN conferences that I have attended ASEAN youth conferences that I have attended in, in, in Thailand in Philippines and other places as well in Singapore, I always remind them that actually we cannot accept and we cannot normalize all male panels when you're talking about. Um, you know, not only about gender issues, but also other kinds of issues with other complexities and where women are actually, uh, you know, very much affected in this in these cases, you have to ensure that women also are speaking and women coming from those specific backgrounds to represent themselves, not men speaking on the behalf of them. So this is actually the tricky part of men, males involvement in, in the agenda of gender justice is as allies, we are not in the middle of the spotlight, we are not the, the, the main actors here, we are the supporting actors, we are the supporting parts of the agenda that actually for those who are most disenfranchised, which is women and, and sexual minorities, they are, they are the one who's supposed to be given affirmative action to actually, uh, you know, to speak up and given more opportunities uh, to, to share their concerns and, 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 and their actions towards uh, facing these issues. So this is what I do is actually when I got whenever I got offers to, to speak, I always ask um, several things. First, um, is the gender composition of the speakers are balanced? You know, uh, is there like, is it an all male panel? If it is, then first I would I would uh, suggest them to search uh, for me to, to look for other alternative from my other uh, women colleagues who are capable in that issue. Or second, I will ask them to give an opportunity to start giving opportunity to my other women colleagues to, who actually, uh, you know, can have a shot at this you, because if you never know that you have tried, right? You cannot expect like, because there are no capable women, but have you actually affirmatively, actively tried to open the opportunity to give women to exercise, uh, uh, you know, their, their capacity and actually be 
the, the expert in this field that you are saying. So, so this is what I do. And secondly, I also ask about the, the, the whether it's pro bono or is it paid or not? Because sometimes uh, for certain groups, it matters whether you pay them as speakers or not. Because uh, we always assume like you are invited by this big, uh, you know, big institution. It is priceless. Therefore, you don't have to ask for any any speaker's fee. But but it is very good for you as well to to just tell them right away: is it a pro bono or or not? Because sometimes also, like I said before, um, the, con the condition of the marginalized people uh, of the social economically and also as uh, you know, sexual minorities, also sometimes even women, they are more. Um, you know, they are more in the positions of actually, you know, maybe it, it concerns more that to them that maybe it doesn't concern me or you, but maybe it concerns some people in those very um, marginalized groups as well. So we have to be uh, 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 be considerate about that. Next slide, please. So be aware of structural problems because personal is political. Uh, personal is institutional, actually. So that's that's why uh, um, I'm very happy to see that very uh, Indonesia have a very much lively young people's movement and network actually now working cross generational with other senior um, you know gender activists as well activists for and, and feminist activists so to actually advocate for uh, against or in favor of certain bills that actually uh, you know supporting the agenda for instance recently we have we have been informed that our parliament is um, is also in uh, talking and will be discussing prioritizing of certain two bills that are actually concerning us. One is about the uh, the family resilience bill, and the second is about the anti-sexual violence bill. So the, the the family resilience bill actually seen like quite problematic because it will if it passes in our parliament in our DPR DPR, it will it will. Assert, uh, it will assign certain strict norms that you know that um, wife has the duty for domestic uh, works and man has the duty as breadwinners, which also burdens men as a solely breadwinner, and also of course burdens women as with all the double, triple burdens, etc., and unpaid care work. Um, so we are so now the movement is actually advocating against this uh, Katahanan Keluarga or Family Resilience Bill in the DPR, and we are support very much supporting the RUPKS or the Penghapusan Kekerasan Seksual Anti-Sexual Violence Bill that's been on hold for so many long. We don't understand why it hasn't become a very much a serious priority uh, for our parliament. But actually, we are supporting it because so so we can support the victims of sexual violence from from all walks of life to actually get the help they need with the cert, cert, certain specific uh, uh, assignment from the bill as well. So these two are just the the tip of the icebergs. There are also several um, local um, you know local laws, state laws uh, that actually en enacted by by uh, by the regional leaders like mayors or governor. There you know sometimes we have this laws that like. You know, you cannot go out at night just only for women because you will be harassed, you know, but then why don't you also start to educate the men not to do, you know, perhaps these women are just going out, you know, coming home from their job. Why do you have to, you know, to, to, to forbid them from going out at night in the first place if, if you cannot ensure a, a safe environment for them day and night in the first place. So actually, this kind of laws, we have to also understand this is not only about raising awareness, getting certificates, taking a photo together, donating, you know, feel good charities. Uh, this is about also changing the behavior of a nation, not only a behavior of one or two people, but also a behavior of a nation through its regulation, through its laws. And that's why we young people also have to be in part, especially we as men thinking gender issues is not only for men and boys and not only for men and women and girls, but also for men and boys. This is about all of us. This is about all of us because one of us is disadvantaged that all of us it is advantage. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, open. Mas Jian, oh, yes. you have two more minutes to finish. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mas Farid. Um, so just as a closure, actually, one of the attendees here is my mom, and I'm very much uh, uh, honored to have her here. Uh, so everything I am, who I am today, uh, is actually I owe it to her. So this is us going together in the Women's March Jakarta. And this is also my sister. Uh, she's now eight years old, and she went to the march with us. I, I am in the Darth Vader suit, by the way. So that's why why I went there, because she is a living testament, a living embodiment that women can be anything that they want to be. But sometimes, you know, gender equality or gender justice is not a choice. It's what happens to you and how you act, act upon it. Sometimes when you say women should, you know, women should be at home and, you know, just do the dishes and do domestic work. My mom didn't have 
that privilege because my mom was was actually you know um uh you know she's been a single parent for many many years of her life and she was in a forced marriage and she survived it uh, like sexual violence etc but she kept coming back for more and she wants to prove that actually women can do anything they they they, they can to actually raise a, a a generation of children that actually believes in equality and i'm happy to be a part of the generation and i'm happy and proud to be uh, to be raised by my mom i'm going to be in tears now but anyhow, so um, this is what I'm saying is like, uh, we have to look around us and, and, and see, I think, especially to men and boys, when we are trying to impose certain masculinities towards other men or, or you know, to, to, to sub subjugate other women around us and girls, we have to question ourselves what kind of context and what kind of life they're living, because not all of us have this perfect nuclear family, etc. You know, um, all of us sometimes, you know, many of us also have imperfections that have, we have to settle with. And at the end, gender justice is not a theory. Gender justice is how you survive in life. Mm -hmm. So this is why we should support this agenda in the first place, because everything has to be equal and, and just uh, in the first place, you know, with or without the uh, all of the uh, issues that we are uh, hearing right now. So maybe that's all about, uh, that's all for me. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm very happy to discuss this more with you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Mas Dian. Uh, not only for uh, sharing about this second. Thank you very much, Mas Dian, for uh, not only sharing uh, the knowledge about uh, you know uh, the situation in Indonesia related to. Uh, youth engagement in this initiative of uh, transforming patriarchy, but also the most important thing is to show your profile that as a young generation, it is possible to transform, you know, like sometimes we, we as a, you know, the older generation feel hopeless when, it, when we see the younger generation, but showing your profile with your presentation, uh, it turns us to be very optimistic to see that uh, in the next future there is a hope and even uh, a big hope, you know, that uh, especially in Indonesia, you know, like people like you can lead uh, this kind of movement, not just the, the program, but also the movement that, uh, you know, in personal level, in ideological level, in as you said that in the even in the structural level we can change you know with, with uh, young generation like you and I hope I can see more people like you be engaged in this kind of program in, in this kind of uh, social movement thank you very much um, I think one thing the point that you show is you know the feeling of uncomfortable of being you know people or young young men who just follow the hegemonic norm of being men you know men who like to uh, uh, you know, oppress other women, who harass other women, men who, you know, that's that, that's kind of profile. We need to be uncomfortable to feel like that, you know, and then transform into uh, into new men who, you know, uh, against that kind of thing, oppression, uh, discrimination, and violence against other genders, uh, minority. Thank you so much again. Uh, next, not to waste time, uh, last but not least, our speaker, uh, my colleague uh, comes up at Cham Sai Suk, uh, who will share, uh, besides sharing about the situation in Laos, uh, as a former uh, coordinator of the regional, regional uh, learning community of uh, transforming masculinity for gender justice, uh, East and Southeast Asia, uh, uh, come also will share you know, the process of how the issue of men engagement turn into, uh, you know, transform more patriarchal masculinity. Uh, come, time is for you. Thank you. Greeting to Deputy Minister and UNAP representative and to all uh, fellow speakers. It's, it's an honor to be in this space with you again, Undaria Tuan, uh, Farid and Boim, and also nice to meet you, Makenta. Um, it's very hard for me to say much after very good presentation from Undaria Tuan and from Makianta. I, I don't think I can add any new things to these conversations. Uh, I will try to keep it short 
um, so that we can move on with Q&A. Um, I must say that the work on addressing patriarchal masculinity in my country is rather new and frankly speaking, quite uninspiring. So we don't have good lesson learned or recommendation to, to provide. But my attempt is just to try to actually use the analytical framework laid out by Undaria in understanding patriarchal masculinity in my country. And hopefully that analysis can inform the work with men and boys and also with women and girls. Uh, next slide, please. So for those who have been to my country, to this peaceful, quiet capital, Vientiane, or some big, big cities in Laos, um, it's likely that your first impressions about gender equality in my country is quite deceptive because you can see that women uh, actively participate in social, political, and economic culture life. Uh, there are certain gender norms practiced by men and women, um, but nothing seems to be so alarming or of a serious concern. And inequality and gaps between the two genders do not seem to be so big, especially in urban and public settings. However, the reality informed by data and evidence tells a different story, particularly for rural and ethnic minority women and girls. More than 60% of Lao population live in rural areas. So that's one condition. Second condition is that we have more than 49 ethnicities in our countries. And with 49 ethnicities, we have difference in cultural practices and belief. So with economic progresses in my country, um, po poverty remain concentrated in, in rural areas and particularly very high among ethnic minority groups living in rural areas. And rural and ethnic women are worse off than any other groups in the society and in the countries. Female-headed households are poorer than male-headed households. And female rural ethnic household, it's much, much poorer than any other house-headed uh, households. Um, Rural and ethnic women are disproportionately impacted by different factors and, and, and have the lowest measures in their well being. When it comes to sexual and reproductive health, we now, as you know, as you even know that it doesn't exist, some people don't even know where that is. But what we are known for is three things. We are um, we have the highest early, early marriage in the region. We have the highest teenage pregnancy in the region, and we have the highest maternal mortality in the regions. So that also signified inequality uh, and issue faced by women in the country. When it comes to education, again, female literacy rate, it's still lower than male literacy rate. And uh, male, uh, female uh, women's access to economic opportunities um, and formal sector is still lower than male sectors, uh, than, than men. Divisions of labor in public and private spaces are very gender. Um, women and girls share a big burden of care works and responsibility at home. Uh, men's work is seen as more value and given more social and economic both. And women care work is underpaid, underestimated, and definitely undervalued. And this even more is true, truer, more true for, for women working in rural areas, doing agricultural works, taking care of family, taking care of animals, and also doing household chores and also generating incomes. And even in Laos, when it comes to legislation, legislations, we do have good laws. Uh, men and women are equal regarding land tenure, property uh, ownerships, and inheritance rights. But customary, customary, customary practices often override official law. So in, for many ethnic groups, uh, land ownership is patrilineal. So only sons inherit lands, but not, 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 not daughters. 
Um, and politically, uh, women's representation, representation is rather low. It's less than 20% in our national assembly. It's only 1% rep of women hating the village. Um, and, and very few uh, in business sectors. And lastly, for violence, um, more than 15% of women aged from 15 to 49 experience physical and or sexual violence in their lifetime. An attitude and acceptance of violence norm in family is very high. So more than 50% of Lao men and women think that family violence or violence against women at home can be justified uh, if there are certain specific reasons. Um, and then uh, traditional practices often do not hold perpetrators accountable. Next slide, please. So why I highlighted women issues in Laos when our webinar is about patriarchal masculinity, I would like to highlight this issue in equality faced by women in my countries and my girls in, and, and women and girls in my countries because the patriarchal norms that mandate superior of masculinity over femininity as highlighted by Kundaria Tuan and, and Magenta. And patriarchal masculin masculinity has put women and girls in a very disadvantaged point um, in my country. It gives more power to men over women. It mandates men's superior superiority over women. And also it provides men with privilege what we call male privilege. Um, and it creates this gap that I just mentioned among men and women and boys and girls. And if you are talking about equality in our country and the development, sustainable development, peace and security for all, the, all people, regardless of gender, that cannot be achieved if we continue to have this gap. So again, um, I would like to use some of analytical thinking uh, presented by Undaria to try to understand the complexity of masculinity uh, in my country. Next slide, please. So to understand patriarchal masculinity, we have to dissect it quite deeply. Uh, can we have next slide, please? Next one. Yes. Um, there's not one homogenic man in Laos, like Undaria and everybody say, there's no one group of men. Every men are very different. And they are, and the norms of being men are very different based on different factors. First of all, as I mentioned, we have 49 ethnicities. So different ethnic has different cultural practices. So being a man or the way of practicing masculinity is quite varied. Uh, among different ethnic groups. Um, for example, in one ethnic group, men move to women's to wife's house after married. For another ethnic group, it's, a, it's the opposite. So with this practice, you can see that it affects women's uh, property ownership and women's protection from domestic violence. In my ethnicity, if I'm married, normally I would move to my wife's house would that, that means that you know my wife would not lose her property inheritance or would be more protective from violence com committed by me because I live with her family. But in another ethnicity where the wife has to move to the husband, that means she wouldn't inherit her property from her parents and she would be more vulnerable because she would live with the, with the, with the husband's parents. So as you can see, different ethnic, ethnic practices can affect the life of women and girls. Rural and urban settings can very can affect the way men perform their masculinity differently. Um, rural men and urban men have different experience and exposures to gender norms and practices. Um, and they have different powers. You know, the, 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 the pyramid that Undaria was mentioning, rural men and urban men do not share the same power when it comes to gender and access to resources. Um, and, and also, if you add the complexity of that, you know, urban women have more power than rural men, for example. So we cannot simplify that all men have power than, 
and all women because that's not true. So there is urban men, urban women, and then rural men, rural women, and then you add ethnicity and educations and economic status, uh, various factors into that as well. Um, religious and spiritual practice also play a role. Uh, Religious institutions formally and informally are controlled by men in, the, in my country. Even though we are majorly Buddhist, Lao has different religious and spiritual practices as well, including anim animism, ancestor worshiping and others. And also, it also bring about different ways of being a man and practicing masculine norm in, in, the, in the society. Uh, for, for example, in Buddhism, when men become monks, it's, it's a celebration. It, it's, it's a good cause for the family and for, for the society. It's, it's honorable. But when, when women become a nun, it's, it's often perceived as a sad thing. She's, she's unwanted. Uh, uh, she's um, she's uh, unvalued uh, woman to join. Uh, religious practice, but this is very interesting how access to spiritual learning can be seen very different uh, from genders. So again, um, using Undarius uh, and other speakers' uh, point about masculinities in plural forms, in Laos as well, there's not one masculinity. Uh, it's, it, there are very different ways of masculinity. Um, and it can also be understood throughout the historical and generational, generational uh, time as well. I think similar to Vietnam, during the royal time before French colonization, after the colonization by the French, during the movement for independence and decolonization, during the socialist movement for reconstructions of the nations and the open market, uh, and the open economy throughout the whole political changes, pol uh, masculine, masculine norms have changed. You know, during, it's very interesting that um, uh, certain ways of being men and women have changed over a period of time to, due to our political and economic changes. Um, it's, it's very interesting to observe that the way my grandfather practiced his way of being a man, my father and me and now my nephews are very different uh, because we, we, we have been placed or taught throughout a different time of our his, history. So masculinities are very dynamic and very active uh, and they are changing all the time. So when, when we are talking about working with men and boys in addressing masculinity, oftentimes in Laos, and I cannot speak on behalf of other places, but in my country, we fail to recognize these diversity and complexities of being men. Uh, we just have, we just come up with a simple approach in working with men and boys as if we are all common and we are the same and it, as if we have similar history and background. Uh, next slide, please. So again, it, it's not so well documented, so I, I cannot share my lesson learned. Uh, but we, we, we have encountered the challenges because as I mentioned earlier, gender norms or gender inequality can be so subtle in this country. When you go to my country, everybody seems to be happy. Everybody seems to be so peaceful. Uh, there's no alarming scene to be seen. It's not like women got bitten in public or women are forbidden for moving around or women cannot drive or you, you don't see women working. It's so normal, women's living quite rather normal life. So, so I feel that we are living in denial that there's no inequality in our countries. So, so we, we, are, we don't see evidence, we don't see data and we don't critical, critically um, look at our own practices. So there's no sense of urgency or no, and then there's a strong sense of complacency of how things are going with us. Everything is fine, why we have to solve. And especially when you talk to most men and women, they all agree. It's not even women would raise the issue. So the movement is still very far behind. The feminist movement and the women's movement are, 
are very young um, and, and, and still very limited. Um, interestingly, legislatively, it, it's quite advanced. The government has pushed a lot of progressive agenda at the same time among the populations. Uh, there's no interest. It's so in, it's so interesting in in my in my country compared to other countries where change is driven from the populations to the government. But for us, the government tried to change, but the population doesn't seem to to be at urge changing uh, when it comes to social norms. Um, and lastly, similar to what Undare mentions earlier. The work on social norm change with men and women are not well integrated in social economic development in my country. It's so this is so this uh, is so separated. If you have a gender project and other projects, so other projects on social economic development are set up in a way that that this that do not recognize the complexity of men's and women's life and the inequality that we face in our countries. Um, and lastly, the, the interventions with young people, with men and boys, particularly, or with men and boys and girls, uh, women and girls, are very, very fragmented and very short term and not thought through. It, like you, they, they, There might be school-based interventions or work with young people for one year, and we hope that everything would change. We hope that young people would become equitable after one year. I think it's a joke, to be honest with you. And I, I'm going to be frank with practitioners, with donors, with anybody who's sitting here. Don't, don't keep ourselves that we have one or two years project with young people and we think that everything is going to be fine. It's so fragmented the way we work with men and boys. We sometimes it's as if that we give them pills and they're going to change. And I think that's that's a lie and we lie it to ourselves, to be honest. Um, uh, what is it? Um, yeah, so again, addressing masculinity, we have to understand different dimensions of being men and, uh, and, and masculine norms. We really have to rethink critically about how we work with them. And lastly, uh, at least in my country, again, I come back to my country, not, not, not as a criticism for other uh, countries or other settings. I don't think the work with male champions for us work. You know why? Because we tend to pick one or two or three male models in the country, either the singers or someone who famous uh, and ask these male champion to be male models or good role models for other men and boys in the country. But that model is a failure because it doesn't talk about the complexity of men in my country. You cannot have a very cosmopolitan, elite, well-educated, handsome men talk about how to be men with rural men who's poor, um, who's uneducated, who, who's trapped in poverty. You know, it's this this attempt to have a few human male being portray the way of being good men doesn't reflect the reality of men in my country. So I, I hope that we move beyond that. I hope, I hope it's more inclusive and it's more analytical when it comes to um, creating good men for, for our countries. Um, and lastly, interestingly, for because we are so connected now, virtually, certain gender norms in Laos are quite influenced by regional and global norms. So what we practice in our country cannot be separated with what practice in other countries. Uh, I think Magrienta mentions about pop cultures, for example. It's very interesting to see how Korean pop cultures influence young people in my country, for example. Uh, we talk about men don't cry. My father wouldn't cry. My grandfather wouldn't cry. But for my nephew now, crying is so romantic. Um, so, you know, but it's not from within. It's from Korea, somewhere far away from us. But how our social norm and gender norms are influenced by, by our neighbors and, 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 and external um, environment. Next, please. 
opportunities for transforming. I think we, we have the opportunity with young people of being more flexible and less rigid with, with, with social norms and gender norms. However, the, uh, the window of opportunity working with young people is very small because, you know, before the, the gender norms are so ingrained uh, so that they couldn't change. So, so Laos is one, we now having what we call demographic bonus where we have most young people in our, in, in, in our history and it's going to decline as we have more aging population. So for our country, this is the moment to try to build norms among young people because in the next five to 10 years, these, these young people will lead the country in social, economic, and political uh, fact, um, arenas. Um, I think the fact that we are in this virtual connection together has, has told us that, you know, there's an increase in connectivities and access to information. I hope that our, my country can learn more from, from your countries, from, from Vietnam, from, from, from Mongolia, and from other places on how to to do things better and, and because you have documented what the lesson learns, what works and what doesn't work, hopefully we don't fail into the same own trap of implementing projects or activities that do not provide any evidence of that works. Uh, hopefully we are smart in, in applying the lesson learned from other countries. Next one, please. Yes, a little bit. Uh, yes, the last one. Come. Two more minutes to finish yeah, the presentation. Thank you. I think this is not really linked to, to Laos, but I, I think Boim uh, has asked to, to me to share some, some reflections about regional movements. Uh, I think East and Southeast Asia ha, ha, has become more connected. And especially if you heard that, I think our governments, the ASEAN government uh, with four other countries have to sign a trade uh, agreement last week. Uh, in the future, there seems to be a bigger plan for our region to be more connected. So politically, economically, and environmentally, we are going to be very connected. So the well-being of one nation is connected to the well-being of another nation. We have learned that from Europe, we have learned that from Africa and from other regions. I think regionally, we have to think collectively um, that you know what whatever happens in one country can really affect another country. So politically, economically, and, and when we talk about climate change that also influence our life in the future. So there's a call for us to work on gender justice collectively, not separately. Uh, we can influence over another. Uh, we have ASEAN forum, we have ASEAN plus three, plus five, plus 10. I think different governments and at the governmental level, at the civil society level, at the business private sector level, I think we can influence each other a lot and we can, can support and learn from each other a lot. Regional norms, uh, this is difficult and this is quite uh, utopia, but at the same time, I think we, we, can, we can all aspire to be equal to be safe and to be happy regardless of who we are. So hopefully we, we can have that common ground to, 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 to build this movement together. Um, and lastly, if we can have the movement for positive change for the in, in, entire region, uh, it, it, it stabilizes our region and it helps us to prosper as a region. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks very much, Cam, for uh, the presentation and for remind us again about the importance of thinking uh, beyond the project, the most important things, and uh, to think uh, that this kind of program, this kind of initiative is a part of the social movement uh, to transform patriarchal masculinity. It is not just a you know, a periodical project or periodical program. Uh, you know, uh, when the program ends, uh, the process also ends, but it is an ongoing, non-stop, never-ending process to transform gender, uh, patriarchal gender inequality. Uh, one thing that uh, all the speaker mentioned and underlined here is the importance of thinking about patriarchy or patriarchal 
uh, power relation is our main enemy here. So thinking of patriarchy means that uh, we need to think about, you know, beyond uh, engaging men or men participation or men and or men uh, engagement. Uh, you know, like engaging men in uh, specific gender roles. Beyond that, uh, it is not not only about that, but it is it is more about the transformation from the personal level to more structural, from the you know uh, individual to more systemic, from the project to more substantial thing. And this is a never ending uh, process. But even though uh, our enemy is a kind of hegemonic system, as Undaria said, but there are, you know, from the lesson learned from uh, Dr. Uh, Tuan, from uh, from Masmar, from from Jian, uh, we can see there is a possibility, there is a change, there is an opportunity that this kind of process of transforming patriarchal mas masculinity is uh, quite possible if we, you know, uh, collaborate, if we uh, do together, never ending, and once again, situate not in a simplifying project, but it is a social movement, it is a social process to end patriarchal masculinity. Uh, because of the, the, uh, the, you know, the limited time, I think uh, let's invite uh, audience or participant if they have any question, uh, you can raise or let me check from the uh, uh, question and answer. Uh, there is one here, uh, a comment uh, from uh, Clara Epi. Uh, first, really appreciate that this webinar have a gender balance involving, you know, speakers uh, who are female, but, uh, and, and also male speakers. Uh, you know, like in the increasing, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the forum like this, there is a, a strong criticism from the uh, uh, Feminist Network MOS forum, even the gender forum uh, only invite, you know, sometimes dominated by uh, the male uh, panelists, but uh, this seminar show that, uh, you know, directly show that it is important for us to invite both male and female uh, in this kind of initiative. Uh, you know, even though it is, that it is not, not a matter of biology, but still uh, the representation is very important here. Uh, Yeah, uh, I think one question here is very important to, to mention about, uh, you know, different kind of strategy, how to uh, transform uh, patriarchal masculinity. Uh, uh, you know, as, as I said uh, before, uh, how to, to, to broaden uh, uh, our initiative, uh, you know, like to engage more, more people in 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 this kind of initiative is very important, and and to to invite uh, more people uh, to be participating in 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 this program is uh, very important. And I think uh, uh, again the difficulty here is to uh, bring the understanding that this kind of program, this kind of movement is not only about men participating in, you know, men participating in, for example, uh, traditional gender role usually uh, performed by, by men, like as I said, it is not only about men involved in, you know, washing disease, it is not only about men uh, involved in uh, preparing uh, food, you know, it is not only about men cooking, but it is about uh, you know, movement again, operation based on gender. It is about uh, justice. It, it is about uh, freedom and respect among different genders or gender, sex, gender diversity and sexual diversity. Uh, maybe if we don't have any question here or, or any, any, uh, any, anyone want to uh, have question, please uh, raise your hand. 
Nobody? Sorry, the day is working. It has been raised. We, we not. Okay, please. If you would like to. This one participant, Mas Farid. Winarty, okay. Oh, yeah. Um, but Winarty, uh, raise your hand. Uh, please, if you want to. Uh, uh, you know, uh, express your question. Okay, thank you. I just want to comment uh, one thing that in the pandemic situations, the topic that we are discussing is important because at home, not only women who do the house chores, but also the family include all and also the man. It's not a matter that uh, the the father, let's say, uh, doing all the dishes and so on, and then the mother teach the children, things like that. Thank you. Yeah. Any comment or? Undaria would like to comment to that uh, uh, from Babinarti. Now, uh, uh, we have one question here uh, uh, for Dr. Tumursu and Dr. Uh, Tuang, and also for Kam. Uh, how patriarchy is apparent in young children in your countries? Maybe one by one, you can uh, share uh, your uh, insight and experience about this question. Uh, starting from uh, Undaria. Thank you. The, I was just going through the questions and uh, they, they themselves are really interesting. And uh, thank you, Clara, also about the folk tales. Uh, I, I totally agree with you, I think. And as I wrote uh, in reply, uh, Monfamnet actually has a training session that uses folk tales uh, to understand patriarchy, to share and deepen feminist analysis of patriarchy. So we take a folk tale and I tell people take any folk tale because you would be very, very hard pressed to find a folk tale that is not patriarchal and participants work in groups to rescript those patriarchal fairy tales and we do role plays or we do some other, uh, use some other creative method. And it's uh, one of my favorite exercises as a trainer. Um, it's a really good question about children, how, uh, patriarchy is present in young children and I think it differs a lot and in my case I if I think back to my own childhood I grew up under a socialist system which was very different from Lao uh, and somewhat different from Vietnam as well closer to uh, Central and Eastern Europe and Soviet Union but also very different from Central Asian republics uh, that were also socialist states in Mongolia, socialism was taken up quite sincerely. Uh, and actually, uh, Mongolia is the second uh, country in the world to announce that it became you know, officially socialist. So equality was a very important uh, part of the ideology during socialism. And, uh, and the state had taken very strong in, in, um, participation in, edu in family education in young children's education. So I'm of that generation where within families, it was considered to be a sign of backwardness if you treated your daughters significantly differently from the way you treated your sons. So I grew up in a family where both of my parents worked, uh, both of them did chores and my brothers did more chores than I because they're older and they were more skilled at it anyway. Um, but then when I think, when I see how young children uh, and young people are raised today, they are actually more patriarchal. The younger generation is more patriarchal. And in my opinion, it has to do with several things. One, it has to do with the economic system, uh, which creates structural inequality. There was no a uh, big inequality of socioeconomic inequality during socialism. Now we have tremendous gap between the rich and poor and few are wealthy 
Um, and so there is this distortion uh, following the transition to what is called democracy, but actually market economy and market economy can be capitalist or not very capitalist, but we transition to neoliberal capitalism. So I think uh, that in socioeconomic inequality, uh, in addition to patriarchy that was never fully abolished during socialism, right? That combination creates new kinds of anxieties that translate into, for example, ethno-nationalism. In some countries, it translates into religious fundamentalisms, cultural fundamentalisms. In Mongolia, it translated into very macho kind of ethno-nationalism. When, when you are thrown into, as a country we, with weaker uh, econo economy, with the weaker pow uh, power within a global system, uh, which is a legacy of colonial era, uh, there's a lot of anxiety. So, uh, and then the third aspect of this, the third ingredient of this is what I call Western uh, patriarchal capitalism. So all of this media that sexually objectifies women and glorifies strong men, superman, rich men. I mean, the movie probably everyone has watched, The Pretty Woman, right, with Julia Roberts. Uh, so all of those modern uh, kinds of folk tales, right, is basically Cinderella all over again. In Mongolian culture, we didn't really have Cinderella as a dominant story, right? But now every girl is watching different kinds of Cinderella stories different kind, every girl has, is becoming princess. You go to a store, toy store in Mongolia and you know, everything is pink for girls and then you know, very limited number of colors for boys. So, uh, um, and I think that sort of dy dynamism in terms of gender uh, norms and construction, modern constructions of femininities and masculinities uh, within the national, local and global dynamic really needs to be taken into account. And in my case, I'm raising two boys, one is 14 and the other eight. Uh, I do try to be careful to guide them because I believe in, I believe it, with my Buddhist background, I believe that forcing my boys to think the way I do would be doing violence to their psyche. So on the other hand, the society does violence all the time through the cartoons that they watch, you know, through the books, through schools, etc., and of course through family traditions and so on. Uh, so it is for a parent, for a feminist parent, it is a fairly tough terrain to navigate. So uh, my boys have, are used to watching cartoons with my commentaries in the background. But now they do the commentaries themselves and we go into different kinds of discussions. Uh, I think there is a way to raise children, boys or girls in this world that develops their awareness and critical thinking, right? More than saying you think like me or you, you think like that. So I think it is complex. I cannot say that there is one kind of influence for young people today, but I think the dominant influences are quite discouraging in many ways. Yeah, thank you, Daria, for providing that answer. Uh, one other, uh, so we can see that uh, you know recently there are more complex factors in producing you know new masculinity. Uh, uh, tend to be not just singular masculinity, but more plural masculinities, which is give us more challenge, but also maybe opportunity for this kind of world. Uh, how to you know adjust. Uh, how to uh, adapt our work, uh, you know, so to make sure that our our uh, process of challenging mas patriarchal masculinity really going well. There is one more question what related to what Undaria uh, uh, explained. Uh, here is about capitalist market. The question is from Ayun Amriti. Uh, you know, it, this is another uh, hegemonic system, the capitalism. Uh, beside patriarchy, we need to deal with another hegemonic system, which is, uh, you know, capitalist market. Do you think our work, like the, you know, things like this, can really challenge, you know, uh, capitalist market, which is another system of hegemony, who, you know, always reproduce a new thing, 
uh, for us and give us problem. Maybe uh, uh, after uh, after uh, Uday give presentation, I think uh, maybe come or uh, maybe Mas Jian can answer this question. Yes, um, thank you, Mas Farid. Maybe you would like to also um, respond to that. So basically, um, I think we need to be also be aware about when this social causes, social issues, and this, this particular context is about gender issues is being commodified in a way that it becomes a label, becomes a marketing um, strategy. It's like, it's about a yes girl, girl boss, uh, yes queen, etc. But it's more like performative ways of actually trying to perform these progressive values that we are trying to fight for. Because in, you know, in a very capitalistic way, and especially I think Undaria has brought a neoliberal capitalistic uh, perspective, um, this kind of movement are seen as only personal people, like individual, we are becoming, you know, we are, this is not becoming a collective work, but actually this is a collective work by we're saying, because we are not saying, trying to change behavior of one person or another, we are trying to change behavior of uh, the whole set structures of society and that involves as well by, you know, by dismantling this kind of economic system that actually doesn't work for everyone, but only works for the, for those who actually benefits from this, like the, the top 1% or also as, as in this, in this, in this case, also the cis heterosexual male as well. So I think we need to be aware of when progressive values are being commodified. And also we can always see, for, for instance, when we buy something, there is this so-called feel-good philanthropic um, um, campaigns, you know, like by buying this, you are contributing to this cause, etc. But the same company also treat their women workers, you know, by not giving their menstrual leaves, by 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 letting go any you know gender-based violence in their workplace, and asking them to sign NDAs, um, and also by 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 keeping the gender pay gap within their companies and their and their factories, or 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 you know maybe they're you know you can have um, I'm a feminist T-shirt. But then, at, uh, you know, those very t-shirts could be uh, um, produced by some sweatshops all around uh, Southeast Asia or East Asia, you know, you will never know. So we have to be, I think, in a way that also intersectional, in a way that we have to see this not only as, you know, expressing or feel good charities, social values, but also we have to see this from a social, political, economic justice perspective as well, by also supporting, by, by also supporting to dismantle all of this kind of system that actually making profits out of the cause that we genuinely care about. And we genuinely want to change as a collective, not as individuals, because when we talk about individuals, then we become disintegrated and there are gaps that we want to close, right? There are gaps, the power that we want to close. There are the hierarchies that that we want to actually, uh, you know, make a more more just society from that. So actually, uh, I think that's my my take, uh, Mas, Mas Farid. It's about collectivity, not individuality, and it's about moving beyond um, performative activism, performative commodity fetishism of this progressive value that we are trying to fight for. Thank you very much, Mas Gian. Uh, once again, we need to think, you know, and being aware about the complexity and the dynamic of working on patriarchal masculinity transformation. Uh, you know, uh, our enemy are a lot, but one thing we need to say that even though there are a lot of enemies uh, on working on this, don't kill our hope, you know, uh, together we can do better and going on, on going. Uh, once uh, another question here is coming from Vidya Hutagalung. Uh, uh, she has a question about the challenge of uh, uh, working on mainstreaming gender equality among the boomers, and this is another challenge too. In you know, in the uh, uh, these days, uh, we 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 never imagined before with the internet ongoing, with the social media ongoing, with the new things ongoing. Uh, you know, a lot of things uh, tend to be our challenge and difficulty, but there are always strategy. Maybe uh, Kam would like to answer about how to deal with this kind of, you know, new community uh, on working on gender but equality. But I must ask, can you explain what boomers is and like, who you consider as boomers? <laughs> Maybe uh, like but older generations, like, like 50 and above? Or 
Yeah, how do we define boomers? Because my country, boomers, is definitely not 70 or 60. Boomers in my country would be now like 40 years old, you know? Okay. Yeah, I, I think that's also need, uh, the, the, the key point here, you know, need to think uh, contextually in every local or, you know, national context. Uh, who are the boomers? Maybe in the state here, boomers are different with the boomers yeah. in Laos. Uh, I'm considered boomer right now. <laughs> you are. <laughs> yeah, so, but, but once again, I think the point here is, you know, different generation, different location, different community need uh, different strategy to work on yeah. these kind of things, you yeah. know. Yeah. But there, there are a lot. Jadi banyak praktek praktek baik. Jadi kita bisa belajar in kita belajar dari dokter Soang dan pembicara lain karena tidak ada solusi tunggal jadi ini sangat penting jadi jadi yang disebut uh, so my phone with how how do we perceive capital market because we are capital why we are part of a capital market it's not something else and we are not part of it the fact that i'm i'm holding iphone i'm part of it you know and then every time we make a con we make purchasing decisions we are contributing to that what Pachenta talks earlier about the social and gender injustice so yeah, I think, and also Bunaria put in 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 the chat in her reply that the movement for gender justice and equality cannot be um, separated from other equality movement. You know, we we cannot be equal when the world is collapsing, when environmental is collapsing, when everybody, when my let's say if my country is flooded. It doesn't matter anymore if women and men are equal at that point. They're going to be equally die, maybe. Um, but you know, uh, or e economic empowerment, we are not going to reach equal equality economically if men and women are not equal. So we are so linked that um, I think we need to think broader and also we need to bring it within ourselves that we are part of it. it this is not something separated from us, yeah. yeah. Can, can I just follow uh, Khan on that? Yes. Um, yeah, yeah I, I, I think we also have to change the way we think that when we work with uh, gender justice or anything that we work with men or women, I think we should also think from like a market perspective. I think as in my presentation, I said, I think we are not attractive enough. I think we have a to, 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 to work more with like a business uh, company like uh, with people who who are the market. I think in that like a uh, mentality to make our product sellable in in the market. Yeah. So 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 I think in that. So nothing like our work is just for development. Nothing. But should think it as a, a kind of product that we can sell, and we can compete with other product. I think that is, I think, one strategy. And I think on, and another one is that we should also to work with the, the all these um, company who produce products that reinforce that gender stereotype to work with them to their side, to, with our side and, and, and turn their product into something like a, um, a gender transformative. Uh, for example, I think recently, uh, in Vietnam, we have a lot of discussion on different advertisement on, on TV, on television, and some really good. Like, uh, I think some product, I think, for example, Coca-Cola just produce a very good video or some uh, like a detergent company produce really good video about how men should be in the family and, and, and how, how they should treat their daughter or wife. I, I think that's that's how so so thinking about how we can work together rather than to see them as the enemy i think i somehow quite like a not like to use the word enemy i know very use that word a lot but i think we should 
change the way of thinking that I think we should see each other as a partner, as a as an opportunity of how we work together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, one thing we need to think also is about there are a lot of social organization, right? Uh, that uh, become part of the established social structure who maintain this patriarchal hegemony. Uh, we miss uh, to talk about the importance of family institution in maintaining this kind of things. Uh, there is a question here, uh, how sometimes we have a difficulty to challenge the parents, you know? Uh, providing us with uh, a certain patriarchal gender norm. Uh, we want to challenge, but we try to respect our parents too, you know, how to deal with this, with this kind of thing. Look like very simple, but uh, in fact, it is very difficult, you know. I don't want to be this kind of man, you know, the violent man, the, the man who, who it is okay to be uh, abused a, a woman, but uh, I learned that from my parents, how I challenge that, you know, that they also need to, 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 to think about, to bring about that there is a lot of social organization who become part of this uh, uh, social and political process who maintain the patriarchal hegemony. Uh, maybe uh, one of you wanna try to respond how to, you know, to deal with it, this kind of things while we understand that we, we don't agree with this kind of gender norm, but because we learn from our parents, you know, it is hard. We need to respect, especially us in Asia, you know, when our parents are just like king in our home, you know, it's really hard to challenge that. Mm. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. I just silent. <laughs> maybe, Did I share uh, some maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe Mas Jian has experienced that. I know you have a very good parent there, but, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe you can share your experience how to deal with uh, such kind of difficulty to, you know, negotiate with uh, the lesson our parents inherit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in a simple in a simple sentence, uh, if I can take uh, the word from Masjian is, it is okay to trick your parents, okay? <laughs> it is okay to play ping pong with your parents, 
uh, for the sake of gender equality. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. I, I exactly yeah. First of all, you, you got to believe in gender equality first, even if your parents uh, teach you about you know patriarchy, but you got to believe yourself in uh, you know uh, non-patriarchal gender relationship, uh, things like that. Uh, we almost run out of time, we almost three hours having this uh, discussion. Uh, 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 but before we end, I know that there, there are still a lot of questions over there. Uh, Please don't hesitate to contact uh, the speakers. I think they will be very welcoming, uh, all of you, with uh, any question. Uh, maybe you can contact the organizer uh, if you would like to have uh, the speakers contact to the email, especially. I, I know that some of them are very active on Facebook too. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you can be friend of them. Uh, but before that. Uh, uh, I would like to remind participant and audience to please fill up the uh, evaluation form and also the attendance list provided by the organizer. Uh, would would you know? Would you like to continue or we end the discussion uh, now? I think uh, Cam looks so sleepy now. It's, it's almost uh, <laughs> midnight in New York, right? Uh, I think we, we, we better uh, end our discussion now, uh, even though, as I said, there's still a lot of questions, but please, uh, if you would like to continue to uh, discuss this very important topic, don't hesitate to contact us, to contact organizer, to contact the uh, speaker too. Uh, uh, at the end, I think maybe a last word or last sentence, uh, the closing remark from all the speakers may be important. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. Tumursu first uh, to uh, give your uh, closing statement. I just wanna thank again for inviting me to this conversation. And I think it is really important to continue having these conversations and to continue learning together. And I think, uh, uh, like, I mean, in relation to the question about boomers, I think there is a new kind of tension that is arising. And I see it a lot in my man context of Mongolia, uh, which is this generational conflict. And I think this generational conflict needs to be taken more seriously. It is not just that there are older people that are less gender egalitarian in their attitude, which in Mongolia's case, as I shared before, is not necessarily true. Uh, but I think, it, again, it has to do in many of our countries, which have a uh, large percentage of young people, the socioeconomic, political, cultural environment is not fulfilling their needs, right? And then there is another search for enemy and the enemy has now become this boomer, which for me is like a mythical character. Once again, I think it is homogenizing. Uh, I think it is discriminating against older people and any kind of homogenization contains violence in the same way we should not homogenize men, should not homogenize women or should not homogenize humanity into only male and female. I don't think we should also homogenize either young people or older people or those in between. Um, you know, we have to be very careful. And I think always where there is conflict, for me, the question is, what are the sources of this conflict? And, and then I think, again, we will uh, go back to neoliberal capitalism. I think we cannot ignore that, uh, you know, uh, elephant in the room anymore and only talk about culture as if it was dissociated from economy and structures. Over. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tumulsa. Yeah, uh, okay, next, uh, Mas Gian, uh, and also the closing statement, please. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I think everybody's happy. Hubungin Sasi, jadi poin saya sebelumnya. Beberapa nilai progresif yang sepertinya ini sepertinya asing di negara saya bahkan disebutkan bahwa ini hal yang bersifat kebarat-baratan. Ini sebenarnya sudah ada untuk waktu yang sangat lama.
Nah, sebenarnya kita kampanyekan. Da, jadi Jadi kalau kita merespon ke pertanyaan Boomer. Jadi seperti yang disebutkan oleh Ria, saya berusaha meningkat akar konflik. Jadi ini ada diskriminasi te- atau egisme yang ada di Asia Tenggara. Egisme. Jadi anak-anak muda itu dilihat sebagai tidak kompeten, mereka tidak punya pengalaman. Tapi kita boleh kayak mengeneralisasi populasi. Jadi kita perlu pembelajaran antar generasi, jadi banyak hal yang bisa belajar dari generasi sebelumnya. Dengan membuang ageisme atau diskriminasi berdasarkan umur. Karena pengalaman-pengalaman ini juga aset. Jadi itu pengalaman langsung. Jadi sebagai sim penutup untuk laki-laki dan laki-laki yang lainnya. Biarpun kita punya latar belakang sosioekonomi yang berbeda. Jadi secara umum kita tidak bisa memungkiri bahwa kita lebih berprivilege dibandingkan dengan minoritas lainnya. Jadi kita perlu kita perlu sadar akan privilege kita. Jadi kita harus melihat tahu diri dengan posisi kita sebagai sekutu. Kita jangan mengambil uh, panggung dan pada akhirnya mungkin kita tidak perlu memberikan mikrofon atau kita tidak perlu membesarkan suara orang lain. Atau mungkin uh, pada akhirnya kita semua punya suara yang sama perempuan itu tidak perlu, tidak akan perlu untuk uh, mendapatkan uh, dibantu untuk dikeraskan suaranya oleh pihak lain. Jadi mungkin pada akhirnya semua itu uh, bisa punya suara yang sama. Jadi kita tidak hanya tentang kesetaraan tapi keadilan untuk semua latar belakang sosioekonomi um, melalu, melampaui semua model sosioekonomi yang mendapatkan keuntungan dari hal-hal ini. Jadi kita harus mempraktekannya dan ini mulai dari lingkungan kita, dari keluarga, dari teman dan kita harus melampaui dan semua aksi itu berarti. Jadi itu pernyataan penutup saya. Jadi sekarang saya ingin berikan waktu pada Dr. Doan. Jadi, terima kasih bisa berbagi pengalaman. Kita bisa melihat jadi kita tahu bahwa ini bisa Ini keadilan gender ini juga sangat penting. Jadi kita bisa melihat ini waktu bagi kita untuk membuka hati kita, mencari cara untuk bekerja sama. Jadi ini kita harus mencari cara. Other than that's one gain or one lose. I think only until when we can find that and and we can like just this gender justice. That's not the one that we like. Cause I sometimes feel think like a few us want, but the gender justice should become something like a some product that everyone, every family, every man, every woman, every other gender, every children want. I think then we can then we can make it choose. And then to do that, I think we, then we also need a kind of, I think we need to change the knowledge, but then the, the norms, the culture, but I also think that we also need a lot of like specific skill for that. Like a, 
we just go to truth for ourselves and to become, I think, to go back to the word, I think, authentic. I think authentic is a very true to a lot of things that we we just discussed, right? The authentic of ourselves, the authentic communication, the authentic pride that 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 we 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 want to have. And 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 that's one example that I think we can say like a, uh like a to be to be to be authentic about what we feel comfortable, but also to be authentic of what we feel uncomfortable and to be able to talk about that, to share about that. And and before we want to, I think one thing that I I, I learn a lot is that before we want to change someone, I think we should change ourselves first. And because of a lot of things we wrote about gender, actually we also ourselves have a lot of stereotype in ourselves, in a way we look at other people. And 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 only until we can open about that, we can change about that, then we can change things. And and for and and I think accepting or silent uh, before, like uh, when you confront something about gender bias. It's not a good strategy, even if it's your parents, because uh, I think keep silence, not solve the problem. Keep silence that hide the crack between people, high crack in the family, and the crack never go away, it stays there. So learning something to tell, like uh, learning the way to tell about that. For example, like I don't know if you learn, that's some simple trick, like a clean talk. So not telling like your parent wrong because no parent will accept they are wrong but but before saying that i think you just say like uh, start from what you see and then talk about what you feel and then what you think and propose change then i think we can get to the conversation because if that's telling some people wrong you never get to a conversation but if say like uh, i see that i see that you you are asking your sister or your daughter do something that I think is not relevant. And I feel that it's, you are losing an opportunity for you to get a better understand of your, your daughter. And, and, and I think that you can do a better job as a father because I know that you love your daughter. And I propose that we can sit together one time that we can have a deep talk about this. And, and I'm sure that this can help you to have a more valuable time, more valuable conversation with your daughter. I, I think I think that's a way. And there are different techniques that can help us to, to get over this difficult conversation and even get a quality conversation. And, and again, I always find conversation and dialogue should be the solution. Yeah, okay. thank you, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Dr. Anne, thank you for uh, being here. And last but not least, uh, come before you're going to bed, please deliver your closing remark. Thank you, Farid. Um, I think the, the advantage of going last is that if I don't have much to say because other speakers have highlighted very important things. Actually, my my ending would be very similar to what they said. Um, three things. I, one is that um, the problem is not a simple problem. It's a very complex problem. So we cannot have simple solutions. We have to keep that in mind in our field. We cannot propose simple solutions to changing people's lives. Um, so we need to be cautious with that. Uh, it has to be based on analytical thinking, based on evidence, based on theories, and based on thorough analysis of the situations. Secondly, the work has to be grounded on feminist principles and feminist analysis that Undaria has framed at the beginning. And we cannot highlight enough the importance of linking our work with other justice movement social justice, racial justice, economic justice, and environmental justice. We cannot be equal, and we cannot live in a happy, safe, dignified life if other factors of our lives are being threatened. Uh, and you know, the environmental threat is not, um, 
it, it cannot be underestimated. And the, the current social pandemic has told us that, you know, gender equality would be set back many years um, if we cannot address this global issue together. And lastly, I agree with uh, Dr. Tuan. Uh, that's one of the points is that it has to start from within. It has to start from home. You know, we have to ask ourselves, what do I do today, tomorrow, in the next week, next year to change my own gender practices, my gender bias, my own gender stereotypes. Gender is not others, gender is us. So if we cannot change ourselves, the way we interact with other men and women, the ways we raise our children, the way we manage our relationships, if it's not equitable, then I don't think we can talk to boomers about inequalities. Uh, so start from within and it's a hardest exercise, but I think it's very important before we build that collective movement. Thank you so much for have, having me and it's very honorable to, to be with everybody today. Thank you so much, Kam. Uh, uh, finally, my closing statement, I would like to unrun all the you know insights from the speakers. Uh, just keep in mind, this is a serious business. This is a business to, uh, you know, to transform, to change the social structure. This is not just a party business, you know, a celebratory business. Uh, we we have we, we enjoy this kind of conversation, you know. But after this, we need to think, you know, transform it into daily life. Please take picture. But after take picture, think seriously too, you know, to bring this in your in your mind that. Uh, this is really serious business too. You know, we, we our social movement is against the patriarchy that's already built in the dinosaur era. I mean, the prehistoric era, you know, uh, and transformed into in, into recent times with the capitalism, with the, you know, uh, internet, things like that, uh, with even with the uh, new political system, maybe with Trumpism now, you know, <laughs> everything's happened. Uh, uh, just think about that, you know, uh, we, we can enjoy this kind of conversation, we can enjoy, you know, the celebratory part or the party part of this kind of movement, but always think this is a very serious business. Last but not least, I would like to uh, uh, present the quote from the uh, Men Engage uh, Declaration uh, and Call to Action 2014. Uh, we live in a world of profound inequalities and unbalanced power relation, where rigid norms and values about how people should behave fuel and exacerbate injustice. We have to change that. And I add in that we can change that with our uh, collaborative and never ending uh, uh, movement. Uh, to the organizer, uh, UNAPA of Indonesian country representative, the Ministry of Women's Empowerment and Child Protection of the Republic of Indonesia, also the Human's Alliance, uh, the Indonesian Human's Alliance, and also the uh, Global Men Engage. I would like to uh, express my sincere thanks for having me here. Also, I'm really honored to be surrounded by my uh, old best friend here. And uh, my apologize if I cannot, you know, uh, uh, facilitate this discussion uh, very well. I'm sleepy actually. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll see you again, okay, in the uh, in the next. Uh, you did forum. a good job. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, Marit. Thank you so much, Mas Boim. Thank you, Kam. Okay, really bye -bye. nice meeting you, Kam. Thank uh, you. Dr. Thank Mas you. Jian. Thank you so bye. much. So happy bye. to meet you. Good night, Good night. company. Good night, everybody. Okay. Bye. Okay, bye.